Thank you and each and every one of you for being here with us today. Uh, well, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome all of you and cheer the opening ceremony to this morning for our first edition of the Neuro Hackathon 2021, uh, organized by the Neurotechnology Scientific Student Club at Nikolaus Copernicus University in Poland. Well, uh, we are happy to experience this event with you uh, as a talented and motivated people from all around the world, uh, like literally, which are, who are interested in neurotechnology, neuroscience, BCI, cognitive science, and other ideas which are going to create a foundation in the future uh, human lives. So, well, uh, this project has been endorsed by uh, the Center for Modern Interdisciplinary Technologies, uh, Nikolaus Copernicus University, um, Emerging Field Perception Cognition Language, uh, and Faculty of Physics and Social Sciences, respectively. Well, um, by the list cooperation, indeed, we have received technical, financial, and moral support, uh, which enabled this event to happen. Uh, well, on such a wide scale. Well, almost um, 100 participants, 19 teams from like eight different countries are attending this hackathon now. So uh, you come from Canada, USA, uh, Italy, Nigeria, the Netherlands, India, France, like Poland, of course, Japan. So like this is amazing that uh, even time zones don't have to bother us. So uh, we saw a diverse scientific background of yours and we hope that um, deep mutual learning process will unfold. So we also hope that this variety of minds connected together and uh, engaged in a creative process um, will result in a great project ideas possible to plan soon in uh, real life. Well, uh, now let me uh, fill you in a little bit uh, in some of our upcoming activities. So, uh, as you know, within the next 48 hours, uh, we will be sharing together our mutual passion for uh, technologies, well, especially the Neuro One. So, um, merging together the energy of all of you, uh, we would like to make this even a place uh, where you can develop and create ideas which aren't like out of the out of the blue or uh, 
just interesting. Uh, but uh, first of all, they are uh, possible uh, to apply in uh, real life very, very soon. Uh, so today, uh, we would like to allow you to focus more on understanding the concept and the main idea of the event. Uh, so, uh, although we invited many great specialists who will introduce you to the topic in more detail. So, yeah, yes, uh, take from it as much as you can and enjoy the speeches. Um, so, as you can see here, we start uh, at half past 12 and uh, we going straight to our uh, first speakers and our first um, block of, uh, of speakers. After that, we have uh, one uh, special announcement for you. So stay tuned and uh, be there. I think this is quite interesting. So, um, but like, yeah, more you will hear uh, about it within um, like uh, one and a half hours. So, so be there. Um, tomorrow, uh, we will, uh, tomorrow, uh, we uh, start at uh, 9.30 a.m. on revealing the topics and introducing the NeuroHackathon's mentor. Uh, well, they are great people, uh, very experienced with the huge knowledge, so it, be, it will be great fun to work with them and have an actual opportunity to work with them. So, uh, um, uh, subsequently, at uh, 9.50, uh, we are going to introduce you uh, four uh, main topics uh, which you uh, could possibly work on during the next 40, uh, 24 hours. Uh, so, and yes, at uh, 10 a.m., you'll start your uh, 24 hours work uh, on novel technological initiatives uh, that could be an answer to in particular uh, real life human problems and cognitive uh, disabilities. So today will be fun and uh, full of learning. Um, so uh, now uh, let me introduce you uh, to our uh, first speaker, uh, which is a uh, uh, who is a postdoc researcher and uh, he, Yannick Roy, uh, well, he graduated in biomedical engineering and uh, electronics engineering. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of NeuroTechX. So additionally, he has done a lot of webinars uh, bringing together people interested in neurotechnology. Uh, he has carried out tons of projects using deep learning, neuromodulation and BCI technology. Mm, his passion and thirst for solving big, meaningful problems uh, is uh, contagious, no matter what uh, role he is assuming in a group or team. So, mm, well, additionally, of course, he is a skilled programmer and engineer uh, able to tackle with success and any technical challenge. Uh, well, Yannick Roy uh, will tell you more about the uh, consumer neurotech. Um, and if you have uh, any questions, just please write them uh, directly in the chat. And of course, after the speech, uh, I will redirect them to, to Yannick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, oh, okay, uh, additionally one thing, so uh, during the, uh, to, during today's lectures, we will send you a guidebook and uh, also a, a form to fill in about the integration. So uh, stay tuned and uh, read the uh, messages. Well, okay, um, well, uh, uh, it's four, uh, four more minutes, but uh, I think uh, I can uh, check if uh, Yannick, can we, can we hear each other? Um, yep, can yeah. you hear me? Okay, so I propose that maybe uh, you can start sharing your screen uh, to see if everything works correctly. Mm. Well, I will stop uh, presenting and and now uh, you can uh, try and share it. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yes, yes, we can see the screen. Okay, well, stage is yours uh, then. Awesome, okay. So yeah, let's, let's dive right in. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. I'm very excited. 
Uh, I've been in the neurotech space, uh, as uh, Sophia mentioned, for many years now, over t over 12 years. Uh, I've been uh, in all the spheres of neurotech, uh, from the engineering side of things, from the business side of things, from the event organization side of things, from the regulation uh, side of things. So I've helped many companies, uh, advising many neurotech companies. Uh, I've been participating to many roundtable, either for regulation with FDA or others. Um, uh, participating to many different events uh, from hackathons. I've been to so many hackathons in the past uh, 10 years or, or so. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Hopefully we'll, you'll be able to, uh, to take a few things uh, from, uh, from my talk. And if at any point you have uh, questions, please uh, in the chat, make sure that you, uh, um, that you send them my way. And then uh, if I can bring more value, I'd be happy to, uh, to do it. So just a couple of words about uh, Neurotech X. I'm the co-founder of Neurotech X. It's a non-for-profit organization uh, whose mission is to uh, facilitate the advancement of neurotechnology. So Neurotech X is seen as an international community. Um, we, to achieve our mission, we have three main pillars, mainly community, education, innovation. So we believe that by bringing people together, then bringing them the, 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 the mean uh, and the, the knowledge, know-how, whether it's more scientific or more technical. Um, and then once people are connected together, have the no, knowledge, know-how, then they can go on and innovate, tackle challenges, start, start businesses, join businesses, and really solve problems in the field of neurotechnology. So all our initiatives are uh, focusing on these three pillars, and we really see Neurotech X as being a funnel or a journey that at any point on, uh, in time, depending on your, uh, where you are in your career, in your Neurotech journey, whether you're just someone who's curious about the field, who've heard about the field, uh, who's studying in the field, who's a uh, seasoned uh, Neurotech expert in the field, we have initiatives for you so that you can grow uh, with the community, you can give back, and you can take from the community as well, uh, depending on where you are in your career. So at this point, uh, we do have over 16,000 members. Uh, we have many different initiatives that I'll just kind of briefly uh, give, give a word in a few, uh, in a few minutes. Um, we've organized many events around the world. We do have uh, 30 chapters now in different cities. We have also student clubs uh, in different cities. So we're really happy to be a very inclusive community and very international community. Um, we're missing some some places on the globe, so we're working on this as a uh, 2022, uh, 2021, and 2022. Obviously, the COVID situation changed things a little bit uh, as per our plans. Um, our main initiatives that we're known for, obviously, are Neurotech X chapters doing local events of different scales, whether it's just smaller hack nights, get-togethers, people are just talking and getting a few people together, or whether it's more of a conference uh, size or hackathons, uh, bigger, bigger events, or just kind of like meet up like 20 to 30 people getting together and having a few talks. Um, the student clubs also, uh, that's kind of a very, uh, it's an initiative very dear to my heart uh, because now we have uh, over 25 student clubs around the around the, the globe and um, it's it's amazing to see so many undergrads so the student clubs are really targeting undergrads uh, the undergrad population because grad students so that was that stemmed from a bottom-up need that were that was expressed from the community because we had a lot of grad students and postdoc and uh, people in the field already but then we start having a lot of undergrads coming to neurotech x and saying I, w I wish I could start my career and my journey in neurotech as soon as possible, uh, but I'm just an undergrad. So there was no really uh, no place where undergrads could go and start hacking, playing with neurotech stuff, learning about neurotechnology. So we start this uh, this initiative, and we have an annual competition where um, every year they, they present their projects and they compete for uh, uh, on specific. There we do have different categories of, uh, of challenges, um, but the idea here is really the learning. The goal of the student club is not necessarily to find the next innovation in neurotechnology, but it's really about uh, learning and exploring the the field uh, in, a, in a in a fun and engaging way. Our Neurotech X Slack, so it's an online community. We do have uh, at this point six thousand people on our Slack community um, online. Uh, Neurotech Neurotech X EDU online education. We're about to launch our EDU 2.0, which uh, is go which is going to be more of a MOOC platform kind of thing, um, so that you can have an interactive and well interactive, more kind of video based, uh, full fledged course on on neurotechnology. 
um, our newsletter. So for people who are not really in the field but want to stay informed, well, people in the field or people outside of the field, the newsletter really cover covers it all. Um, the idea here is to stay informed on a monthly on a monthly basis. Um, Neurotech X Services, which is a more recent initiative that we started. The idea here is that we had a lot of people looking for jobs and opportunities, and we had a lot of company also coming up uh, and looking for talent. So we decided to put a structure around that where we can facilitate the matchmaking or the connection between the the supply and demand or the, the needs in the field and the talent that can provide and fill these needs. Um, so with the Neurotech X services came the job board. So we have the more the, the, the most active job board in neurotechnology. So we're really happy about that. And a couple of other initiatives as well. Uh, so if you're interested in knowing more about Neurotech X, uh, I invite you to go on the, the website. Um, but just quickly on a few of them, the, the, the job board, for example, uh, if you're looking, if you're interested in the field and want to get an opportunity, whether in academia or industry, uh, please, by all means, go on neurotechx.com slash job and you'll find uh, yeah, a job board where we populate that with about 30 positions in academia a week and 30 positions in industry a week. Um, it's 100% focused on neurotechnology opportunities. Um, if you're interested in... Uh, Having a 360, some people might not be as familiar with the field. So if you'd like to have a more introduction uh, on the field in a 360 fashion, then I would invite you to keep an eye on our book, who's going to be. It's a long time coming. We've been. It's a community effort that we've been working on for, for quite a while, but it's coming out uh, in a matter of probably in, a, in two months from about two months from now, it's going to be available uh, for you to either download freely online or purchase as a hard copy. Um, I'm going to skip the 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 other initiatives. Uh, maybe one, if you're interested in knowing uh, what are the companies, what are the research labs in the field. I think that the Neurotech ecosystem, the database that we recently released or made public, uh, so we do have a lot of, uh, we do have about, uh, 1,700 companies that we've identified, we've tagged, we've labeled what they are doing, where they are located. So if you're looking, for example, for a company that are doing uh, magnetic stimulation in X city in the world, like in London, for example, um, in, sp in a specific city, doing in a working in a specific uh, specific field or doing a specific uh, technology. Uh, it's very it's very user friendly. We're working on a better UX, but for now it provides a lot of value if you're looking for different uh, companies or research labs around the world. Um, so once again, on Neurotech X website. So on a more hands-on uh, and DIY leading to more of the neurotech, uh, the consumer neurotech space that, we're, uh, that we now live in, I would say. Uh, one project that we're really excited that we've been working uh, on for quite a while um, are our EEG notebooks. So a lot of people wanted to do what is being done in research, uh, namely cognitive neuroscience experiments, uh, but using more of the consumer EEG devices that are more uh, that are low cost and more accessible. So we've been working on our EEG notebooks for for quite a while. It provides a lot of different values. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Jupyter and uh, iPy well IPython notebooks um, that you can that you can download that you can get from GitHub and you can run experiment P300 experiment uh, SSVP experiment. We have kind of like uh, many different kind of experiments that you can download that you can use with different devices. Uh, I'll explain and I'll show most of these uh, consumer devices that you can uh, that, that you can integrate with. Um, the idea here was really to kind of uh, empower people um, with research tools, but in a more consumer framework with low cost devices at home at home kind of a, a setup. Um, and we're about to run kind of a crowdsourcing experiment. So we we did all the ethics approval for, for that. So we're gonna be uh, doing a big, massive crowdsourcing experiment. Everybody at home with a device will be able to record data uh, and we'll uh, gather kind of like a big data set of, uh, of DIY crowdsourcing EEG experiments uh, at home. So that's going to be a massive project. We're really excited about that. Um, and you'll hear more in, uh, if you're following Neurotech X, you'll definitely hear more about that project in the, the, the coming weeks. So hackathons. Um, in the in the Neurotech space, uh, hackathons, well, we've, we've seen a couple of hackathons before 2015, but I think that 2015 was a big year and, couple of years after that and now it's kind of, it kind of exploded um, but also personally for me 
2015 was a big year. I attended uh, many, many hackathons, one in uh, San Francisco with the Neuro Gaming Conference, one in Israel uh, with, uh, with Brainiac. Um, so in Tel Aviv, um, we also had one simultaneous hackathon with Amsterdam and Montreal at the same time with Hack the Brain in, uh, in Amsterdam. And we had the uh, BCI Montreal, which became Neurotech X um, later that year, actually in, 20, in 2015. Uh, and also Brainiac, that was a global effort in many cities simultaneously as well. So we had a big year, I would say, for Neurotech hackathons in, 20, in 2015. And after that, in the years that have passed since then, we've seen uh, many different ha BCI hackathons and competitions really increasing in <clears throat> in volume, but also in uh, in location as well around the around the globe. So it's not just the San Francisco of the world anymore, but it's really so in so many cities and happening sometimes simultaneously as well. So the Brain IO hackathon from GTEC, uh, Brain Hack, Neurotech X are doing some hackathons as well. And we've seen so many different uh, awesome events. And it's, it's very interesting to see because so many uh, skills are being developed and so many new connections, new friends, new people uh, working on cool projects. So the spirit of hackathons is not necessarily to make the next innovation. It can happen uh, and it happens sometimes. I'll give you some, some examples. Uh, but really the beauty of hackathons is really kind of learning, developing skills, uh, using that time window, which you're spending a lot of time. And it's kind of one of the best ROI skill development wise, if you will, uh, because if you're about to spend 48 hours of, or about that, that time window, work on a project that you're very excited uh, about, that you have a deadline, that you have a competition that you're going to be presenting, uh, you're kind of putting your brain and yourself in a turbo mode where you're really into it. You get in the flow in the, in the flow zone. Uh, you have also colleagues that depends on your piece of code or hardware or what you're, what you're building because you most of the time you'll be building kind of like a small piece of, of the puzzle uh, that your team will benefit from. So it really puts you kind of like in a specific mindset where you really, you're really efficient um, at learning. It's not necessarily, you're not always achieving the goals you wanted to achieve, but you're definitely spending a lot of time of trying something. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but you're spending a lot of very productive time from a learning perspective. Um, so one of the most famous hack uh, that led actually, or opened the door to many other uh, consumer neurotech that we that will present in a, in a second, um, the most famous is probably the, the MindFlex hack, which was well documented. So it was in 2010 when someone took the MindFlex, which was a toy based on the NeuroSky chip, um, opened it and plugged it with an Arduino to access uh, the, the raw signal of the device on the, on the computer. So the guy documented all the hack, how he opened it, how he wired it, connected with the Arduino, and how he got access to the signal. And that motivated uh, someone based in New York called uh, Connor Russomano, who then after that went on, reproduced the hack, and then improved upon the the hack that was that, that was made, and then started the company knows that uh, as OpenBCI, which has been in operation and in the the open uh, in the neurotechnology space for uh, for many years now. So that was uh, just kind of a segue or an example to show that sometimes you do so you, you do a hack, you do a project, uh, you should definitely document it, put it online immortalize it uh, so that other people can look at it, reproduce it, build on it. Uh, and sometimes you might not innovate yourself, but someone else might pick up your project and branch it out and innovate based on that project. So if you do something um, that you think might be just worth documenting, by all means, you should definitely document it put some pictures, how you did it, why you did it, put it online. It's also good for your portfolio as well. Uh, something that we don't necessarily stress enough, but there is a big change in hiring from big tech companies. Well, that has happened for many years, but if you're still in the old culture of education is the way uh, for getting hired in big jobs, I would challenge that a little bit that now it's a lot project-based. Uh, big companies like Google and other have been really public about that. The fact that they are they will ask you what projects have you have you worked on, what have you built, what have you made. So when you do these hackathons and these projects and you work with, with on things like that, might not be the next. It might not be any useful actually. It might not 
be a finished project, but document it, immortalize it, put it on GitHub, uh, and then you will see that when you get an interview at a, a, at a tech company, um, you'll be happy to talk about that project, and the interviewer will probably be very curious about ask, asking questions more on that than your actually school path and your classes that you that, that you took. So uh, use that as a good opportunity to um, add to your portfolio items. So the consumer devices uh, that we've seen, obviously any, uh, any talk in the consumer neurotech space, we have to acknowledge and talk about the big four, the original big four that paved the way to so many other Kickstarters, some uh, devices that died uh, shortly after being released on the market or some devices that are still active, but it really opened a new world that, were, that was reserved to uh, the medical space and the research space and to very high price devices that was limiting uh, innovation in that space. Um, so NeuroSky was, uh, was the, the, the first one, a good, it got good and bad press for many reasons. It's it's one electrode, so that's the one at the uh, left, uh, the right bottom on the of the screen. Uh, it was uh, it has one electrode on the forehead. Um, it's been challenged a lot uh, from the scientific community, mainly because of the quality of the sensor and also because a lot of what they were claiming from the algorithm and the signal processing of what they were getting was a lot of muscle artifact. So it makes sense if you put one device on your forehead and, for example, you're trying to focus and pay attention on your screen, you might, uh, you might move your muscle, uh, you might kind of uh, be focusing on your, on your eyes and every muscle movement that you do with your forehead, that will be picked up by, by the device. Um, but the point here is that it still challenged the research equipment and the $50,000 kind of devices that were being used. And now the NeuroSky was, was, was sold at a $100 price point. So that's a massive difference. Um, so obviously it got challenged. The quality, yes, is not as great as a, a medical or research equipment. But still, it opened the door to, oh, we can do EEG on low cost. Might not be the, the same quality, but still, uh, for that different in price, there is definitely value and it's worth exploring and creating new devices based on uh, EEG device or electroencephalography technology becoming cheaper and cheaper. So open BCI, Muse, and Emotive uh, were the, the others. Uh, they all targeted, so they were kind of smart in their marketing and not trying to overlap too much with one another. Um, so they all found their, their niche targeting. So open BCI was really, we don't have a form factor. We just give you a board. You have electrode and you just put them where you want on your head. And you can also do other biosignals such as EOG, for example, to measure uh, your eye activity and also EMG, ECG. So since basically you, you have a bio biosignal acquisition board with wires and electrode, and then you can put the sensors at different places on your body and your head, and you'll get some, some signals from, uh, from there. So these were the big four. They've been in operation for many years. Um, and that opened the door to, okay, how can we, what was the next wave of innovation? And definitely more recently, one of the, the big exciting wave is definitely the VR wave. So it's been supposed to be the VR year for six years now, uh, probably. But now we start really feeling, obviously, that the, the, the VR headsets are coming, uh, are coming in, our, in our home uh, shortly. And it just makes sense to embed EEG and biosensors in such headsets. Because the challenge with EEG device, like the, the one that I just presented, is why would you wear a weird headset that makes you look weird? Um, if we can embed these sensors in something that you're already wearing and that's, that's fit on your head as well, because one of the challenge with these sensors is the, you need some pressure on your head to make sure that there is a good contact with the sensor and that it really touches your skin. Because if it kind of moves and it's, it doesn't have a good contact with your skin, then the signal won't be really reliable. So having a, you already have a HMD uh, kind of a, on your, on your head and you have to tie it. Uh, already to have the, the VR experience. And so when you move your head, the, 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 the 
head mounted display doesn't kind of like go left and right so it needs to be tight and need to contact with uh, with, with your skin so why not embed some sensors so there's been a lot of attempt and we're starting to see some uh, some some devices on the market uh leveraging vr and biosensors namely uh, with uh, with eeg since it's a uh, very low cost so open bci uh once again trying to innovate in that space they've been trying different form factors they've been trying to put some electrodes in different uh, in different ways uh, as many as possible but also as comfortable as possible so that you when you can wear it for more than like five minutes before it starts uh hurting um and recently this year they released their uh Galia device which is a collaboration with valve which is a big uh gaming company so it's exciting to see that a big company like valve which was not known as a neurotech company but really as a so if you're in the game if you know a bit about about the gaming industry you probably know valve the company behind steam and so many uh big uh big Big, big franchise in the in the gaming industry. So they've collaborated with OpenBCI to release the, the their um, their neurotech device in VR. And the CEO of Valve, I've started to be very public about the fact that he really believes in BCI uh, as uh, the future of uh, of gaming. Next mine was a very exciting, uh, well, is a very exciting, but it was announced at CES uh, over a year ago. Um, they, now their development kit is available is available for purchase. You basically have a small device that you put at the back of your head and it leveraged a visual cortex, so visual stimuli with your brain. So they released a SDK that you can use in, in Unity to embed some, some triggers and some flashing uh, patterns that your brain will... Uh, will perceive, and then you can decode with the device leveraging the the, the visual cortex at the the head uh, um, uh, uh, behind your head. So the for those who are not necessarily familiar with with those in the in the BCI world, you can sense what we call the 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 reactive BCI category. Uh, you can send some flashing signals called SSVP for steady state visual evoked potential. So basically, if I can if I send a strobe signal at 10 hertz and that you're looking at that flashing light at 10 hertz your brain will produce a signal at, at 10 hertz so if i send send you one at 12 and one at 10 then your brain will depending on which one you're looking at then i can see if i see a 12 hertz signal in your brain or a 10 hertz signal in your brain and then i can tell you basically where which stimuli you were looking at so if you have different objects in a room, for example, the objects that you are looking at, if they are flashing at different frequency, I can tell you which one you're looking at. So it creates kind of a more um, uh, mind-controlled uh, environment that you can have with a small device that takes mind released. So that's for a bit more of the VR. Now another form factor that has been trying to, uh, to be leveraged or explored is can we do something around the ear or within the ear? So with the challenge with EEG most of the time is that hair is kind of like blocking the signal. So since we have the we have our ear, we're already putting some devices near or within the, the ear. So can we put some sensors there? And what kind of brain signal can we can we get? So there's been a couple of hack attempts um, and some research projects on uh, on these kinds of device. And now we've seen different uh, sorts of headphones coming out on the market with some EEG sensors. So since I'm already wearing headphones, why not try to put some sensors there so that I can not have to wear a weird EEG headset, but just my normal um, headphones. And then I would have enhanced capabilities with these headphones, whether measuring focus, for example, adapting, blocking my notification if I'm in the in the flow states, in my, if I'm being productive. Um, so a bunch of different features that I could have now that I can measure my brainwave in real time while wearing my, my headphones. Um, one interesting project is the one from Neurable that is currently on Indiegogo. Um, so the same same concept as the one just before headphones, and you have uh, you have some EEG sensors embedded in these uh, in these headphones. So they are still on Indiegogo for another seven days if you're uh, interesting interested. So the what I wanted to uh, to present with the different form factors is we really started from here's the EEG headsets with a weird form factor um, because. 10 years ago, when the wave really started for consumer neurotech, it was just easier to, here's an EEG device, and then do something with it. 
what we've realized is it doesn't really work. The community doesn't really work. Just a weird EEG headset that does nothing and that we decide what to do with it. Um, because why would you wear a weird EEG headset? So the sh there has been really a shift towards how can we embed EEG as opposed to just the product is an EEG headset. It's more of here's a normal device that you're going to wear that you're already wearing in your life. And now it has some EEG capacity so that you can leverage that, that technology and uh, add a biosensor to a device that you are something that you're already wearing. So we've seen some sensors in glasses, in cap, in headphones, um, in VR headsets. So we're really trying to embed some sensors in uh, already existing form factors. Neurosity is, um, so is a company that started in targeting the programmers. So uh, probably many of you are coders uh, here. So I figured that I would present uh, their, their, their device. So once again, another weird looking EEG headsets, but still uh, they were, they are really targeting the, uh, the, the coder community where they want to enhance your coding experience when you're in the flow, uh, really about your productivity. How can we improve the productivity of programmers and coders? while uh, so that they can wear their EEG device and have an experience with their their computer but also up to their coding platform so if you're interested in knowing more differently have a look at neurosity um page interesting device for those who are a uh, coder and programmer who wants to improve their productivity um so the consumer devices uh it's been they, they've been sold in different areas what is interesting with that is we haven't seen many pushback or backlash aside from one that has been really public, which Brinco presented in 2018, that they wanted to, similar to what I just showed here, with trying to improve the productivity of uh, when you're programming or when you're on, on your computer. The idea is if, since we can measure uh, the level of attention, concentration of, uh, of people while they are learning or doing something, can we bring that in classroom settings for kids, for example, or teenagers? and enhance the school or education experience by knowing if they are actually paying attention, if they are confused, if they are lost, or if they actually understand what is being presented to them. So uh, it's been attempted in, uh, in, uh, in by, by Brinco, presented in 2018, and they tried on, uh, on China on younger children, and it's been kind of like a, uh, there, there's been a massive pushback of why would we try to put EEG sensors on our, on our kids, since we're not even sure if it's really working, if it's really providing value. So there's been a massive pushback, which I kind of compared to what happened with the Google Glass, um, where when, when Google released their Google Glass, there's been kind of like a massive pushback because of privacy, because of so many concerns. And I think that we're, we're going to be seeing a bit more of these in the coming years uh, with, uh, with neurotechnology as well, with the neuroethics, with what what does it mean for people for uh, for companies to have access to our brain waves on a um, on our regular on our regular life? So it's not just in a research where you give your consent, you wear the EEG uh, device for research purpose or for medical purpose. But now that you're we're about to use them in our daily lives, what does that actually mean from a neuroethics standpoint? So I think that we're going to see uh, a bit of the some of these kind of pushback, like Google Glass. Uh, it's part of any innovation. When we bring a new innovation to market, there is always pushback. And then we convince the public of the value and why we why we should accept these device. And over time, um, usually we integrate these uh, these device in our in our lives. So I'm I'm gonna skip the the next just to go to the last uh, the last part uh, so that I'm I'm on time as well and respect the the other speakers. Um, I just want to let you with some red flag alerts. I would say since we're seeing some Kickstarter, some new devices, and um, what we're gonna be seeing in the, in the neurotech space for we've started seeing that for the last couple of years, and we're definitely gonna be seeing that for the next next years as well. Is really that since we don't really understand the limitation of these devices, what we can really do with these devices, we'll see a lot of snake oil, fake marketing, uh, fake claims. So please, by all means, be very uh, 
crit critical of what you're reading. So for example, this one is one of the most famous example where a device was released for understanding what your, uh, what your dog is thinking and why uh, your dog is woofing. So obviously we cannot understand why we cannot read dogs talk. Um, so by all means, don't, don't fall for these kinds of, uh, of claims and marketing. Another one that was uh, very, that is misleading. That was a Kickstarter, uh, the Mindo Kickstarter device. And if you read the, the description of the device, which is at the bottom left here in the text, um, it says that, that you can record your brain waves. It will record your thoughts and then you can replay them. You can replay your thoughts or your friends, your partner, your children can replay your thoughts and their brain will understand your thoughts. We're nowhere near thoughts reading. So we can understand a couple of things that, uh, um, for example, with modern imagery that you want to move your left arm, right arm, these kinds of little things, but we're far from be able to read your thoughts and let alone transferring or uh, bringing them to someone else's brain. We're very, very far from there. So uh, don't, don't fall into this kind of, uh, the, these kinds of uh, marketing and Kickstarter. NeurotechX, uh, as a community, we're trying to play a little bit of the neuro police in the field and trying to uh, call out these, uh, um, the, these fake claims. Uh, but obviously, uh, we cannot uh, police all the, all the market. Uh, we believe that the best way is just to amplify the voice and the message and just talk about these things, the good ones and the bad ones, um, so that we can discard the bad ones and elevate the, the good devices. So on that, uh, if you have any questions, comments, I'd be happy for uh, the remaining two minutes. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Yannick, for this interesting speech. Uh, yes, we have uh, some several questions. So uh, let me, uh, I think we have time for maybe two. So um, are these devices picking up signals only from specific areas of the brain? Uh, are they usable in terms of uh, SN ratio? So when you ask uh, only from specific areas of the brain, so these devices, so the EEG uh, technology, normally you have one, sen well, many sensors, but one sensors will be located at one specific area. Um, and you will get mainly the signal from that area. But what you need to understand is EEG is picking electrical activity from the brain. So if you put one sensor, for example, on the, on the forehead, what I'm getting is all the electrical activity from all the brain that is being perceived by that sensor. So obviously activities happening closer to that region will be way stronger, but from the forehead, you can still pick up a little further if the, if the electrical activity can propagate on the, up, up to there. So usually you'll, you'll put sensors on the area of interest. So for example, if you're interested in the visual, uh, visual activity, you will put sensors behind your, behind your head uh, because putting that on the, the forehead, on, Theoretically, you're picking up signal from, from behind because the electricity still goes, but it's being uh, uh, erased uh, or overwhelmed by other signals that are closer to the forehead if you're, if you're putting sensors there. So mm -hmm. normally you will put sensors where you're interested in. And in terms of the uh, SNR or signal to noise ratio, so EEG is a very noisy, uh, very noisy technology. That's, that's the challenge. Um, because you're picking up some signals, but you're picking up a lot of noise as well. So uh, the signal processing, you'll have to clean uh, to clean it. The quality of the amplifier, uh, obviously, if the signal is not perfect, uh, you'll have a lot of, uh, of noise. So it's a very noisy signal um, mm -hmm. to, to use, but you're still picking up your signal of interest. Okay, okay, thank you very much. We have uh, more questions, but uh, my uh, proposal is to just uh, make a script of the questions and if you could answer them uh, on, on this uh, document. So we will send uh, your answers to, to the participants because we have some more questions, but uh, sadly we don't have much time to, to answer it. Uh, so thank you once again for a great speech and uh, hopefully uh, we are waiting for your uh, responses. Okay, so uh, now I would like to, uh, I would like to present uh, you to the other uh, of our uh, great uh, speakers. So 
Um, our next speaker uh, is a Professor uh, Piotr Durka with his lecture, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About BCI But Were Afraid of Ask. Uh, were Afraid of Ask. Uh, so, uh, Professor Piotr Durka is a, a physicist, sciences, um, is a professor of uh, physics. Physician scientist specializing in biomedical physics. So uh, he got his degrees from the University of Warsaw, uh, where he initiated Polish research on brain computer interfaces. Uh, and uh, the first world uh, neuroinformatics uh, bachelor program. Uh, so he's also the founder of the brain tech company producing neurotechnology, EEG, and BCI systems. Uh, Professor uh, Piotr Durka created the world uh, first professional EEG system for fully based on uh, upon open source uh, software, and continuous development of EEG and BCI systems. Uh, so it's very uh, it's my pleasure to to welcome you. Uh, uh, here on our hackathon and uh, I see that uh, your presentation is seen uh, I guess that we can also hear uh, you hello Piotr. Uh, hello hello everybody thank you for the okay. invitation and very precise introduction so we can skip the introduction Stage is slide I, yes yes thanks so we skip the uh, introduction of myself and are there any questions first of all anything you would like to hear because we just had a wonderful summary of nearly everything <laughs> so there is hardly anything I could add no questions okay so I will, I will try to be more specific on smaller amount of topics so the what we will be talking about are brain computer interfaces based based on electroencephalogram EEG and to avoid falling into traps like we were presented before the only the only way is to really understand what's going on so let's get these things a bit slower uh, as we all know encephalogram was discovered by polish scientist adolf beck in 1890 although officially it's attributed to richard Caton, who 15 years before has uh, written this famous sentence in the uh, summary of his grant who basically failed the, the paper by beck was very uh, renowned and detailed about the nature of EEG and finally the first encephalogram from the surface of the head was collected by Hans Berger in 1924 and that's the first lesson we should take from the history because his face first paper was in 1929 so we have these five years and he spent these five years making sure that what he's really recording comes indeed from the brain not from the well, electric kettles, maybe not by then, but they were, the, he was not recording artifacts. And most of the devices that we are seeing nowadays record mostly artifacts. So let's see what it exactly means. Uh, this is the movie that is available on the uh, company site or from my website that you have seen, durka.info. And we see here a recording of EEG everything that goes on on the screen behind is uh, recorded online from the electrodes on the head like Hans Berger did however as you see the most of the things we're observing before were, were coming from either muscles or eye movements and it maybe we shall play it again oh no this doesn't go like that sorry ah! I Okay, I won't be repeating anymore. We go, we go as it goes. Uh, sorry. Well, now probably you don't see my window, so I have to get it back. Yes, yes, exactly. You can see. Okay, presenter. This. Now, now you have the video again. Yes, yes, everything is seen. Okay, great. So, the artifacts can mimic any true EEG activity and they are inherent to any recording. Only this, this is from all we have seen on this movie, all that was before were artifacts. If you have sorry, any uh, on the... Uh, sorry, but uh, now uh, the uh, um, window wrong, is wrong window. Okay, mm -hmm. again. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Window. 
Okay, this one I hope. Right? Cool. Um, yes, yes. Okay, so this again, you see again the eye movements, muscles, the, these potentials are way, way, the EEG is microvolts and uh, the basically man works on electricity and there is a lot of different electricity, not to mention, of course, the bad equipment or external electricity. So this is the first important caveat that not everything that we record from electrodes on the head comes indeed directly from the brain. So now that we understand EEG, we should get the basic understanding of the brain-computer interface as such. And here is the very good resource at braintech.pl slash BCI. And all the materials that I will be presenting come from this website. And the first, first basic brain-computer interface that allows for communication, as all, all, we are all programmers here, so we know that one BTS now is enough. And that's the, uh, this presentation shows you how the P300 uh, BCI works. So we are recording online EEG and the computer notes the events when the yes or no was flashing. And then we average these pieces of EEG uh, triggered by yes or no. And in a perfect world, in a school book, we get if we were paying attention, which means it's not what we are looking at, if we are paying attention to the button yes when it was flashing, then if we average several repetition of this EEG uh, linked to this occurrence, we get the nice, uh, nice even uh, evoked potential. Of course, in the reality, we never wait uh, long enough to have such a nice, uh, nice potentials. But uh, that the problem is statistical. We ha only have to say that the response for yes was stronger than no, and that how it works in theory. Now, the practice again, we have to deal with a lot of stuff that involve artifacts and this kind of problems. So, up. okay. The movie does not work, as I see, for some... Oh. What? Okay, whatever. Unfortunately, this is, this is an example of a system that is... Damn it. Um, no, the movie doesn't work, unfortunately. But this is an example of the training session that we have what we have developed at BrainTech, what I wanted to show you as an example of a real-world approach, is the online screening system that shows you not only the brain waves, the impedances, but also the progress of uh, how do the potentials look like. Because uh, in one of the recent papers, we were debunking the notion of BCI illiteracy. If you look at the literature, many people say, oh, well, it's like, 40% or maybe 20% of the population are not able to use BCI at all because blah, blah, blah. Uh, now, in my opinion, it's just the failure of the uh, scientists, not the failure of the participants. Because in many cases, you mistake, for example, broken electrode or failing algorithm for human inability to communicate via BCI. And exactly based on this kind of experience, we have developed a system for online monitor monitoring. Oh, here it works, OK? Here we have already, after the training session, here we have the BCI session. And you see that online, you, you can watch uh, this on a, another computer screen on or on a phone or anything. You have this flashing yes or no. You, you see the EEG. You have the impedances here. But you also online monitor how are the averaged potentials looking like what says the classifier and if anything goes wrong you can just interrupt the session and restart it and not like it normally was uh, the standard that you uh, get a participant to spend two or three hours of very hard work and then the data is not good so we say okay this guy does not communicate via bci uh, next thing that we already have had mentioned is steady state visual evoked potentials. You can also make a BCI based on SSVEP. And as I noticed in one of the questions is whether the SSVEP is not harmful. Well, yes, it can be harmful uh, to a low percentage of population for those who can develop photosensitive uh, epilepsy, photoepilepsy. There is a small percentage 
of population. And it's not only SSVP, but also any kind of light flashing with like 10 or 20 times per second. That's why for SSVP to be safe and also comfortable, it's not only the danger, but also if you look at things like several hertz flashes for more than 10 minutes, it really makes you want to puke and it's really annoying. So the nice thing is to make the high frequency stimulation for SSVP and indeed brain reads frequencies like 20, 30 or 40 hertz. But the problem is that you cannot, re cannot render them reliably on a computer screen and programmers here know it more just as good as I know. So the first solution that we were uh, proposed by Philips and many others was to have hardware controlled uh, LEDs that were flashing, let's say here it was 40 and 42 hertz, but they were hardware controlled and they were like a bank teller approach, they were outside, but they, some people were gluing it in the screen. It was not very natural. So we thought, let's combine these two approaches and put an array of LEDs behind the screen. And it was first shown on CBIT. So you have LEDs here behind the screen and in front you have a normal, uh, normal uh, LCD that you can render symbols. And that's how SSVP uh, uh, based BCI may work with flexible uh, rendering stimuli. Now, eight years after the first presentation, we uh, created a device with 320 segments that allows you basically to highlight any uh, more or less arbitrary area of the screen and research the user's attention. Because it tells you not the SSVP does not tell you what you're looking at. It's not gaze tracking, but it tells you where do you concentrate your attention. So it's not only BCI when you, can, you are supposed, it's probably not the most efficient way of communicating with, with brain waves, just to focus in painfully your attention tediously on this letter, Baba, okay, got it, I write the next, next letter. You can concentrate your attention on the parts of natural scenes. You can highlight because these high frequencies, let's say above, above 30 or 40 hertz, they are almost invisible to the eye. The refresh rates are in the order of 50, 60 hertz. So you don't see it, but your brain does see it. And you can, in a certain way, you can read from your brain what you were thinking about, which part of the screen you were concentrating your attention upon. So it can be a story, it can be a movie, not only brain computer interface, it's like a new opens new possibilities in attention monitoring in, in psychology and maybe also in interactive multimedia yet to be explored. And this way we have uh, fluently passed to the applications of brain computer interface. And as you see, it's not applications of BCI is of course the communication as such, and it's trivial, nothing to speak about. But under the umbrella of BCI, we have a lot of uh, technologies that are technically similar, but with completely different with completely different applications. And one of them that we're pursuing is the uh, problem of uh, one of the problems that uh, contemporary medicine is not able to address in a reasonable way, which is the care of people in with disorders of consciousness, which commonly known as coma. So the, after brain injuries or with, uh, because of other accidents, people sometimes fall into coma, which later on develops in one of the states that were seen before. And the proper assessment of these uh, patients is crucial for, for rehabilitation, for, uh, for treatment, and in, sometimes also for end-of-life decisions. But the problem is that uh, classical medicine is based upon this feedback loop when you ask the patients whether he or she is getting better. In this case, you cannot ask the patients if he or she is getting better because uh, communication is non-existent. So we can use similar technology trying to get directly from the brain the information whether the brain is working or not. And technology is also the same. This kind of, we were starting in the alarm clock clinic in Warsaw. So first of all, we had to develop things to bring it into the hospital in, uh, to, 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 uh, to make a BCI on a bedside. And then also in this 
In this clinic, there are mostly kids, so uh, communication with kids is difficult as such. Uh, but uh, we had to also uh, make the stimuli that would be reasonable for kids. So we made, for example, uh, using the voice of parents, we were asking, now please, how many times have you seen a birdie on the screen because we are counting photos, blah, blah, blah. And you have the classical P300. If you get better response for a bird than for a cat, then you already know that the kid has understood that he is able to make a mental task and the brain inside basically is working. So that's that's one of the applications. And we had question in the meantime, I used to be interrupted for P ear P for motor. What about SSVP? Exactly. SS, I, I, okay, I think it's already this question is already answered because SSVP we already addressed. Okay, basic the first and basic uh, application uh, of brain computer interface. What I was reading in the first papers when I was starting is of course that you have the locking state patients. Locking state is something that can develop after after the coma. And locked-in state is uh, basically what you may call the hell on earth. The neurodegenerative diseases like uh, ALS, they are killing motor neurons. And the cruelty of this disease is uh, not the, the, the killing of neurons because we all die eventually, but the cruelty is that the brain remains intact. So everything that you wanted to finish stays inside and will stay there because we, you don't have means of communication with the external world. So for these patients, then BCI was originally thought. However, things are more complicated than they looked at the beginning. And uh, when I started the uh, neuroinformatics, I was a lot on in, in the media and many disabled people came to me with this hope because, well, you said brain computer interface will help will help me communicate. Then I learned the hard way, what I put in here on this slide, that uh, if the patient has any muscular activity left, and most of these patients can move their head or a finger or anything, then using this uh, remaining muscular activity, you will create the interface that is faster, easier to use, more stable and cheaper. Because, for example, we're talking about artifacts. We think, okay, paralyzed patients. Paralyzed, this kind of paralysis when the patient does not move is very rare. In most cases, these patients look in a, uh, move in an uncontrolled way, and this creates a huge amount of artifacts. So, because of this, we also created a system that is based, this is not a brain-computer interface, is based on the muscular activity, but we made a software that can make uh, life better for for people and it's of course GPL and available at pisac.org and I think this way we have time for questions right so did the science field try to use lock mm -hmm. lock locking amplifier well there is no need for a locking amplifier uh, first of all the, the, the EEG amplifiers are differential amplifiers. Ah, to search for galactics. Maybe the galactics are easy. EEG is complicated, brain is complicated, okay? Uh, if I know, first of all, uh, the EEG amplifiers that you should be aware of, the good EEG amplifiers are, are called differential amplifiers. So it's not that we record this side, this side, and then we subtract it someplace. We are, everything that you record is a difference of potential between some of the two electrodes. Because as I shown before, it's microvolts what comes to the surface of the head from the brain. So any, any activity that is in the air, any activity of muscles or anything will be stronger. And the differential recording assumes that you, ha you have the same artifacts on both electrodes and only the difference comes from underneath. And this is already good enough. And then if you have the EEG, there is really no problem to uh, make a, a bandpass filtering and it's, 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 it's easier. I mean, the, the, the problem for the quality of recording is good enough. Uh, 
Oh, Christian, same question again. <laughs> well, 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 well. Of course, no, no, SSVEP is not used to, uh, to illuminate. You can try to illuminate the, something in a public space, but how the concentration of, uh, of the viewer, how strong it would be revealed in the EEG, it's, I mean, to be tried. It's hard to say. Of course, you would have to use high frequency. That means that you would have to use a reasonably good EEG, because if you were talking about uh, higher frequencies, you won't get them with emotive or, or toys like this. And yes, I think it can be tried. I, I don't know the answer, because in a museum, if you're sitting in front of the picture, uh, in the in front of the painting, and half of the painting is highlighted with different frequency, that will work, of course. But if you're running, if you have different rooms, if you have uh, also, I mean, you know, no, normal BCI uh, is, uh, usually we have problems with uh, presentations of BCI, if there is a noise, a uh, lot of people talking, etc. cetera. Uh, what, uh, wait a minute, uh, F nears, of course, very nice, but you know, it's, it's uh, uh, nears signal is, uh, uh, first of all, nears signal is slower. Uh, NIRS collects the hemodynamic response. And first of all, it's not the direct trace of thought, because first, the NIRS is the same, uh, physiologically, is the same like functional MRI. So first of all, you have the area of the brain when the neurons work very hard, then they need food, then, then the hemoglobin comes in, and only this we can detect, and this is delayed by a few seconds. First of all, secondly, the, the signal is extremely noisy. And thirdly, the uh, recorders are more expensive than EEG. A part of this could no problem. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's it, right? We made it. Uh, well, right. actually, uh, we have uh, two more questions on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, so um, I can see that. Uh, can we determine the frequencies for SSVAP by ourselves or are there any specific frequencies we need to use and how to how to define them? Well, the beauty of steady state visual evoked potential is that it re reproduces very, very exactly the frequency of the stimuli. Okay, so actually we are the one who choose the stimuli. Now, what kind of stimuli we want? Well, the, the easiest one, and most of the studies that you will see about very, very fast SSV PBCIs will be in low frequencies, like 8 hertz, 10 hertz, 12 hertz. It also coincides with the alpha, but response in these uh, bands are very strong. The mathematics is easy. You don't need very good amplifier, you need very good mathematics to say from FFT that there was a strong response. However, as I said, it's in a significant percentage of population it can induce photoepilepsy, and also it's extremely annoying, okay? So then, secondly, uh, that, so we want frequencies in so-called middle and high range, which comes like 30, 40 hertz, and then also there are, uh, we researched curves because there are different responses for different frequencies. And normally, as a part of initial setup for, uh, for personalized BCI, we re research uh, the responses. Actually, we find, we look in, uh, in the brain tech system, we look for frequencies that give the best uh, contrast between the frequencies that uh, the BCI will use efficiently. So in each, for each person, it can be different, slightly different. We have different brains. And SSVP is one of the things that will work out of the box. Of course, you don't have to make any calibration, but it will work much better if you try to adjust the frequencies for a particular user. OK? OK. Well, we have next question in the chat. It's quite long. Yeah, I see. Yes. OK, we go with this okay. one. Uh, okay. 32 channels for motor imagery. Mm, 32 maybe. Going above, I wouldn't say. First of all, if you do motor imagery, if you do only motor imagery, 
you don't have to go into like 10 10 or more dense uh, area, arrays of electrodes all over the head but you it's not, you put a specialized uh, setup with electrodes above the motor cortices and in that case i think something like 10 uh, 10 electrodes per site should be useful of course this is the most in the other task like p300 of or ssvp the few electrodes are surely enough and getting oh man i have 256 electrodes eeg system is plainly stupid because you don't use most of the things and the more electrodes you have the more chance the more time it takes to set up the more chance the channel will not work etc etc why motor imagery indeed needs some because uh, this is very localized and very weak so we usually make additional contrast like your derivation of spatial Laplacian. And for the spatial Laplacian, you need also surrounding electrodes. So like, like 32, especially if you put those 32 only in the areas like 16 here and 16 here, that it's, to my knowledge, more than enough because there is a natural resolution also that you should not, makes no use exceeding. Okay, is that the answer? Thanks. So, Okay, so um, I can't see any more okay, questions. Okay, any other question? You have a lot of resources on my webpage and the on company website. There are introduction to all the major things, and a part of that you will also find my email. So mm -hmm. I think that's it for today. Okay, so okay. thank you a lot for very thank interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and the good questions and attentions and. Have it was fun. nice to be here with us. Thank you a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so uh, I think that we can uh, go straight to our next uh, great uh, program. So uh, let me uh, share my screen for a while. Um, okay, so uh, our next our next speaker uh, is. Uh, Professor uh, Władysław Duch. Uh, he is a full professor and uh, the head of the Neurocognitive Laboratory at Center for Modern Te Interdisciplinary Technologies, NCU, and an employee of the Department of Applied Computer Science at Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun. Well, uh, he worked in many highly reputable institutions all, the, uh, all around the world, and uh, the main areas of Professor Duch's scientific interests were initially computer computer and molecular physics, uh, then computational intelligence, including methods allowing to understanding data structure, general theory of computer intelligence based on uh, similarity assessment and composition transformation and meta-learning, uh, which automatically finds the best model for a given data set, neurocognitive informatics, um, for example, algorithms inspired by the way the brain functions on many levels, cognitive architecture, and many, many, uh, many more. So currently he's focused on development of the neurocognitive laboratory at the Nikolaus Copernicus University, including theoretical and experimental uh, research on cognitive processes. And today, a uh, professor will uh, tell us more about uh, the brain computer brain interface. So uh, can we uh, hear uh, you, professor? I hope so. Okay, yes, we can hear you. So I'm stopping yes. presenting my slide and uh, the stage is yours. Well, how do I, how uh, do I display so, my screen? Uh, okay, so uh, below you have this uh, white uh, belt and on the right, uh, on the left, uh, right, left, right corner uh, on the down. Uh, oh, you yes, have present the, now. Sorry, sorry. Present yes. Now. Okay. <laughs> I can see that, um, or maybe uh, I just present not the screen but the window, mm -hmm. and this is this is my presentation. So um, you've heard two excellent talks on uh, well practical aspects and many uh, uh, well systems that are already in existence and I want to talk about the future and what I find as a scientist uh, the most interesting. Okay, 
uh, I feel that that we are in this moment of history where we are on the threshold of a dream. Uh, that's the uh, old uh, Moody Blues <laughs> record that uh, some of you may may know, because we are slowly getting to the point when we'll be able not only to read what happens in the brain uh, using all kinds of devices, but to influence that somehow or to optimize the brain processes. And uh, that should help us to really, well, achieve our human potential in a in a better way. I, I know it sounds a bit like uh, the, <laughs> the dog EG, but uh, I believe, especially in case of damaged brains, uh, we will be able to help in uh, neuro rehabilitation and uh, repair some uh, problems with the brain. But not only, also with uh, uh, with the healthy people, I think this is going to be quite useful. So to do that, we have to first find the fingerprints of specific activity of the brain. And we've heard from Yannick that, um, that actually we cannot read thoughts. And I'll try to show you that we actually can do this, uh, although we still don't know how to do it with, with EEG, but we are getting in this direction. Uh, so once we will be able to find the fingerprints of specific brain activity, we would like to understand how it all works by making uh, computer simulations, cognitive architectures, that is special programs that can actually um, handle all kinds of data related to brain activity and predict how that will uh, evolve. And then we can talk about new diagnostics and therapeutic procedures and then uh, we'll try to use neurofeedback and neuromodulation uh, to induce some changes in the brain. So uh, the brain computer in neural interfaces, uh, uh, as the uh, uh, European Union uh, is calling that, has been really 21st century science because there are only a few papers written in 20th century in the last decade. Uh, European Union has contributed over 50 million euro for BCI research and, and it seems like uh, in this uh, new horizon uh, program, uh, seven years program, and there will be even much more money in this. The BCI society uh, has uh, actually been uh, using all kinds of brain and body signals and um, if you look at, uh, at the webpage of uh, BNCI Horizon 2020, there is a list of over 100 companies involved in BCI, and we, we've heard about that a bit uh, in the first talk. So that there have been many large-scale European projects uh, related to the use of BCI in rehabilitation, assisting people with severe disabilities, uh, using all kinds of uh, additional physiological sensors with um, EEG, the MindC projects, um, multi-adaptive, multimodal neuroprothesis projects, neural control bidirectional um, hand prothesis and um, upper limb prothesis as well as uh, the state dependency of neural response to external stimuli, which was very interesting project still going on. So um, all this uh, has obviously many applications that we've heard about. Uh, the um, signal, uh, the signal uh, may be either invasive, partially invasive or non-invasive. And we've just heard about this non-invasive approach, which is based on, on EEG, but um, uh, people are really talking a lot about partially invasive uh, control, which is much more precise, less noisy, uh, which is based on electrocorticography. Uh, well, the, uh, the BNCI has a great vision, BNCI Horizon 2020 Roadmap. Uh, that, that's a, uh, a document that the group has produced. Uh, and the roadmap for 2025 is that there should be routine applications in personal health, monitoring and medical treatment, and that we will uh, seamlessly connect uh, integrating various biosignals with, uh, uh, with the uh, computer and um, information technology devices, that people will work in um, uh, safer to relevant fields, for example, uh, and the BCI will anticipate whether they are already 
too tired to do the work, uh, I will anticipate fatigue. Uh, the game, health, education, lifestyle companies are going to use biosignals and uh, lots of other things uh, uh, on the practical side. And uh, that uh, also monitoring brain signals will provide uh, estimates of mental capacity, rehabilitation after stroke, uh, new treatments for all kinds of problems like uh, epilepsy, depression, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, etc. Restoration of motor functions and uh, also BCI locomotion systems, that is uh, exoskeletons, uh, wheelchairs, activation of limb muscles uh, uh, in, in, in case of spinal problems and uh, lots of other things. So there is a great vision that within a few years now, four years, uh, we will have plenty of uh, BCI around, uh, which may actually happen. But what is really uh, the most interesting for us is to understand how uh, our mental states, that is the intentions, for example, that we have to do the movements or to um, control something with our thoughts, uh, are mapped uh, from what happens in the brain. So, so well, it's quite practical. The state of the brain has to be mapped uh, to the state of the mind and vice versa. And that is done via intermediate uh, models of uh, brain computer uh, 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 interfaces. The, the mental states and movements of thoughts may actually be connected to trajectories in our psychological space, in, in the uh, uh, different mental states that follow each other. And we can try to infer that from simulations of neuroimaging uh, uh, and um, uh, this is uh, what we try to do by looking at the mental states, which have to be coherent, strong, uh, synchronized activations. Many processes go on in parallel in our brains, and uh, it's very noisy. And most of these processes are automatic, hidden from the self, uh, unconscious, uh, but various subnetworks compete all the time. They kind of a shout uh, uh, and uh, may actually get. Uh, get accessed uh, using this uh, very common um, mechanism in, in, in uh, neural systems, which is winner takes all, winner takes most. Um, and um, then they kind of dominate uh, and are able to be recognized by motor cortex, by um, auditory cortex. We can hear our thoughts. We can actually, you know, perform all kinds of actions because there is sufficiently strong activation, synchronized activation. But it's very chaotic, so how do we extract things? Well, there are several approaches to this. Of course, EEG and BCI is what you hear about, lots of processing of the signal, lots of uh, machine learning before we come to some understanding and decision processes. Another is that people mostly suffering from uh, epileptic seizures uh, may have, uh, well, uh, electrocorticographical uh, devices that is a kind of a mesh of electrodes which is directly on the cortex. And um, when we had, um, had a meeting in, in Miyazaki in Japan two years ago, there was two days uh, full of talks about electrocorticography. And the signal is of much better quality and you can then control things or use these thoughts much more precisely. The best thing is, of course, with the microelectrodes and there are fantastic results now uh, coming from, well, mostly animal research, but also there are people who have hundreds of microelectrodes uh, in their brain. And this is what you've heard probably about, uh, Elon Musk is talking about, right? That uh, we'll have all these electrodes. I don't think healthy people are going to really volunteer to have electrodes, but there are lots of different um, approaches to signal acquisition as we've heard today. Uh, for example, this kind of uh, new device is coming, looks like uh, soldiers' helmet, uh, including FNIRs and, uh, of course, much slower uh, uh, systems like fMRI or, or PET, for example. Uh, MEG, uh, even MEG, actually, it has not been mentioned, but there is now one device which is going to be portable. Um, in case of epilepsy, you may have this uh, kind of, uh, uh, well, mesh of uh, electrodes directly on your head. And so you can actually control your brain. There is one 
commercial system called RSN, which uh, can actually, uh, with the uh, electrodes which are in, uh, well, brain areas which uh, start the epileptic um, uh, activations, um, uh, may pick up the signals and may try to inhibit the signals. So the, all these invasive interfaces are um, going to be important. And uh, of course, the brain uh, the deep brain stimulation is used even by neurosurgeons uh, at our university in, in the clinical hospitals. Well, there, there are several paradigms that you've heard about. One is that, uh, that people are using VCI uh, for mental state assessment, for motor imagery, for P300 and uh, SSVP. Uh, and mostly 94% were uh, based on EEG. Uh, FNIRS is still rather rare, about 3% fMRI or real-time fMRI, for example, is very interesting, but too costly, uh, so EEG is dominating. And um, what are the uh, different, way, different ways of, of using um, BCI? Uh, well, it may be passive, reactive, or active. Uh, it may be open or closed loop. Uh, and um, uh, you can talk about the assistive or augmentative uh, uh, approaches, applications. You can talk about central or peripheral signals. You can talk about invasive or non-invasive signals. And then this passive, reactive, active, or open, closed loop. So there are many dimensions um, in which uh, you can place different BCI systems. Active BCI, right, basically are based on intentionally modulation that uh, uh, we try to, you know, form some kind of imagery uh, motor activity in our brains uh, that that are going to be picked up by EG and uh, will control something. Reactive is when the uh, brain activity is evoked by external stimulation and is modulated indirectly through voluntary attention. For example, this SSVP, uh, it's uh, kind of reactive. Uh, and then passive is when automatic involuntary brain activity uh, like arousal, stress, workload, vigilance, emotion, surprise, etc. is measured. And um, then without our intentions, it's just interpreted and showed um, uh, that ha helps us uh, to perform some actions. So passive BCI is quite interesting and has not been mentioned yet. Uh, there, there, it's used for mental state assessment, for, ex for example, cognitive workload, neuroergonomics, light detectors, neuromarketing, etc. And then we have the open loop adaptation, which uh, looks at specific brain states, and that has to lead to specific actions. For example, we, we may look at the feedback based on mental state assessment. Uh, uh, when uh, the brain is reacting, for example, the error-related negativity the signal may appear and that may override human errors. And then we can have a closed loop adaptation when the specific brain state is leading to certain assessment of mental state and uh, in, in response to states, uh, uh, well, um, when we notice that or when the signal is brought to our attention, uh, it will change the state and we can uh, influence um, uh, or do some actions like neuromodulation to influence uh, how this next mental state is going to change. So closed loop adaptation is a especially effective when we combine BCI with direct brain stimulation using magnetic fields, TMS, or uh, electric currents, DCS, enhancing activation of specific brain structures. That leads us, of course, to the application neurofeedback. And I must uh, <laughs> say that the first article in the Polish, uh, well, press has been probably my uh, well, uh, note or article in Przekry, which was a popular weekly magazine, still exists in 78. And since that time, not much has changed. People still look at alpha neurofeedback and try to induce alpha neurofeedback. But we can do much better than that now. Uh, and uh, well, there, there are lots of technologies emerging, the mobile brain body imaging, for example, recording movement, eye tracking, various sensors, reading biosignals in natural situations. Uh, Scott Mikey, who is one of the greatest experts from uh, University of San Diego in California, actually has visited uh, um, us um, a few years ago, or rather visited the, the, uh, the uh, summer school that uh, has been organized um, 
in Poland, and uh, he talked about this uh, mobi type systems that they try to develop. The, the brain computer brain interfaces are based on closed loop neurofeedback. And there are two interesting ways that come from actually fMRI uh, that uh, we try to kind of mimic or replicate. One is based on decoded neurofeedback or DECNEF. The, the, this this is uh, how the um, Kawato uh, Mitsuo Kawato group in um, in Kyoto is calling that. The chronic neurofeedback is just focusing on discovering fingerprints of brain activity in specialized in in uh, selected uh, brain areas, and then we can look at functional connectivity neurofeedback, or uh, use uh, what is also called synchronized uh, brain computer brain interfaces, FCNET, functional connectivity neurofeedback. To do that, we need uh, brain fingerprinting, or we need to discover which parts of the brain are active. So we heard uh, some questions, whether it's motor or other, and we can place electrodes where we well expect um, to find the activity and uh, make it more dense there. Uh, but we want to record the brain signals and then decode that, that is understand uh, where the signals comes from. That means from the signal at the electrodes, we have to project it back to the brain areas where the signal is originating. And then we, we want to encode stimulation that is going to change uh, or to activate some additional brain areas or to increase synchronization between them. If we could do that, then we can influence how the brain is changing um, in much more effective way than just using neurofeedback or just using simple BCI to control things. And there are many ways now to do brain stimulation. Uh, it may be based on this transcranial magnetic stimulation, magnetic pulses. We just have acquired a really powerful machine for doing TMS. Um, and then uh, it can be also DCS, the uh, transcranial direct current stimulation in all forms. Uh, both of these uh, are growing very quickly. DCS is rather uh, inexpensive, so people are using it more widely. So uh, one of the cups that you can get is, uh, uh, well, um, uh, full of uh, EEG electrodes, but some of them actually are to run the currents through brain for DCS. Um, and it, it has been actually used for treatment of depression, pain, psychosomatic disorders, regulation of neuroplasticity, as well as to speed up learning by increasing neuroplasticity in, uh, in a short uh, time windows. Uh, Neuropriming works, and uh, surprisingly, if you prime your brain by running some currents uh, so that your uh, motor cortex is kind of um, activated uh, um, or preactivated, uh, there will be some benefits for almost an hour. So uh, people who uh, are athletes actually may uh, use it as a kind of, uh, well, uh, doping uh, approach, which is impossible to, <laughs> to really, uh, you know, notice and it's not illegal. And uh, uh, some uh, articles claim that this can really add quite, uh, quite a lot to the strengths of the, or the power of their uh, uh, activity by uh, pressing, uh, by activating muscles uh, much uh, more uh, than uh, just uh, with your will. Uh, well, neuromodulation is getting uh, uh, more and more common. There are lots of technologies uh, which are uh, well, um, directed towards things like Parkinson's disease, uh, tremors, spasticity, chronic pain, and other things like that, and neurodegenerative diseases, epilepsy, depression, etc., which is uh, uh, which which involve all kinds of neuromodulations. I don't have time to to really talk about that, but one thing is that we don't understand why neuromodulation works. Uh, we have tried to actually uh, put uh, together uh, with Professor Sabo from Magdeburg one, one project he is mostly interesting, uh, interested in neuromodulation of the uh, eye muscles around or the um, uh, also uh, neural systems uh, uh, related to vision. And we're hoping that we're going to well verify certain ideas about why neuromodulation works. Um, uh, but uh, I don't have time to, 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 to talk about that. Uh, uh, let me say a few words about this fingerprinting. We have a large 
projects called Symphonia uh, with people from Mensky Institute. Uh, this is the um, Institute of Experimental Biology in, in Warsaw, where, where people working on the brain are um, uh, concentrated. <laughs> we have people from the Institute of Physiology and Pathology of Hearing, the uh, neuroimaging system, the, the group, uh, and, and of course from, from, from Tori. Uh, and uh, when we look at what happens in the brain, we see that there are local uh, well, sensory and other subnetworks which are densely connected, but then they exchange information between each subnetwork through the flexible hub, which is the frontoparietal cortex. And when we look at how strong are connections between different parts, so this is the left part of the brain, the right part of the brain, and it's uh, divided into very large groups, as you see, but you see that in case of autism or uh, um, uh, tuberosis or other things like that, uh, uh, there are very weak connections. So, so the idea is, can we really diagnose the problem by looking at where the connections are weak, and can we increase this uh, these connections? And in the case of healthy people, you see that people who are highly creative have different kind of a network than low creative. So, can we really help people be more creative by? encouraging the brain to develop connections, like in case of high creative people. And uh, uh, well, uh, probably uh, uh, the, the best example now of how it works is from the Kawata group uh, again, where he was looking uh, with fMRI, was looking at people with autism and uh, healthy people and could look at connections and said, okay, if we combine these trends of the uh, largest or most frequently used uh, uh, transmission channels in the brain or connections, we can have an index and this index is going to be high for people with ASD, with uh, autism spectrum disorder, and will be much lower for typical people. And we can do that for other things like ADHD, major depression, schizophrenia. And so in the end, we can have biomarkers of mental disorders based on how information flows in the brain. Now, the question is, can we do something like that with EEG? And this is a big challenge, of course. So there are two ways uh, how we can try to influence what happens in the brain through the neurofeedback. One is this decoded uh, networks uh, or decoded uh, regions uh, where we just, uh, well, uh, what Kawato and, and lots of other Japanese are doing now is to put people in the scanner and use real-time neurofeedback uh, in, in the scanner. Uh, we can use also the connectivity, that is, we can try to induce uh, stronger connections or synchronize connections between different parts of the brain. And it has been shown that actually if you induce that with the magnetic field or, or currents, people will actually um, uh, improve their working memory and improve their functioning. So, uh, well, one way of doing that is, is by uh, well, looking at face locking values and other kind of a functional connectivity uh, measures that you can use with the, uh, uh, well, uh, EEG uh, channels. Another, another will be that we have to solve uh, or to project what we measure uh, uh, with the electrodes to the sources, and this is what we also work on. Uh, another is that uh, that people have uh, shown that actually you can recreate large scale networks that people measure from the uh, using fMRI uh, with the high density EG. So so you see the um, uh, default mode network, for example, uh, recreated from the EG signals, and this is fMRI, or this is uh, the uh, dorsal attention network, and this is the fMRI dorsal attention network. So this is doable. The question is, is it doable in real time and can we do it quite well? So uh, I, I want to mention also that uh, using fMRI, people have been quite successful at showing uh, uh, people's uh, uh, different objects. Let's say you, you have 100 pictures and then you measure actually the uh, activity of the, of, uh, of the um, visual cortex. And from this activity, you try to predict the uh, features which uh, are um, uh, representing images. You don't, you don't predict images, you, you predict features of these images. 
And then when you have a new object, uh, you try to predict the features for this new object and match it to the feature features uh, which, which you have for 100,000 different objects uh, in your database. What that gives you? Well, it allows you to interpret what you see or interpret your thoughts. People have done that with the auditory signals, people have done that with visual signals, and training your brain on 100 images, you can predict uh, what you imagine or what you think of uh, for 100,000 different things, including dreams, actually. So this brain reading is really very uh, uh, interesting. And one thing that people have done in Galant Laboratory in Berkeley is that, uh, that uh, again, using fMRI, uh, they have created this semantic atlas. If you go to this lab and you click on animals, talks, change, text, people, uh, uh, containers, whatever, you can actually get a picture and explore it because there's an interactive uh, tool there that will show you how the brain, averaged brain um, activity looks like. So this is a flattened cortex and you see some brain areas uh, when people watch movie and there is a murder or think related to, to uh, the concept of murdering someone, uh, uh, which parts of the brain are overactive and which are inhibited. The blue are inhibited, the red are overactive. And you can do it for all these 1700 different things that they have picked up uh, from the uh, fMRI signal. Okay, so can we do it with EG? This is a big challenge, and I've just you know scratched the surface because there are so many different things that uh, that we would like to do with this. If if we could do the the, the brain computer interfaces uh, in the closed loop uh, by using this decoded approach, that is looking at which parts of the brain are not sufficiently active. For example, after the stroke, you need rehabilitation, and you hope that some uh, well, parts of your brain are still uh, going to pick up the signals that uh, normally has been uh, worked on uh, by the damaged parts of the brain. And you want to make it stronger. Or you want to actually, because uh, intelligence depends on this uh, frontoparietal networks, you want to synchronize your frontoparietal <laughs> network, right? So you want to use the, uh, the uh, functional connectivity uh, neurofeedback. Um, we would like to have systems that can do it in real time, do similar things like fMRI, which happens to be quite uh, effective, but uh, is not practical, of course. And then uh, the brain fingerprinting based on EEG and FNIRS, for example, may well help us to do similar things. It's still a big challenge, and uh, we have some ideas and have been working on that for some time now. And the brain reading and stim stimulation requires sophisticated data models and understanding of uh, neurodynamics. So uh, one way of doing that is to do brain stimulation and um, try, to, um, try to learn from these stimulations and simulations how to stimulate. And the roadmap is to do the brain fingerprinting based on EEG, sensory stimulation, activate subnetworks, select regions, and uh, then we hope to get to the point where closed loop um, brain neural uh, system computer interfaces will be really effective for neurofeedback. So, uh, one uh, hopeful uh, hardware development is also the neuromorphic hardware, uh, which will be very complex, but also can work very quickly on this type of signals. And uh, still, uh, we have to um, do a lot of work before we'll get to the to these uh, practical closed loop systems based on the uh, on the EEG. So. Uh, we have now uh, formed a group neuroinformatics and AI in the University Center of Excellence in Dynamics, Mathematical Analysis and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, and uh, we look for, uh, well, uh, unfortunately, the money is mostly for uh, researchers from abroad, young and, and more experienced. And in this field, it's very hard to find, to find researchers uh, uh, who would like to come uh, um, and work at the university because there are so many opportunities now. So thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Professor, a lot for your lecture. Uh, I can see that we have some questions, but uh, I don't think that we have a time to answer them. Well, uh, as I said to, to Yannick, uh, there is a possibility that I will send you the questions and you will maybe uh, provide us a 
quick answers to them so I could uh, redirect it um, uh, redirected to to our participants. Thank you again. It was great to have you with us today. Um, okay, so um, I would also ask you for uh, stop sharing the presentation uh, because uh, we still uh, see. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. Uh, this is stop presenting here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, so uh, as I uh, told you before, uh, now uh, is the time for a special announcement and I would like to share it with you. So uh, let me uh, share my screen uh, again. Mm. Okay, here is the tab. So I hope that you can see uh, everything now. So. Okay, so as we know, uh, we planned uh, uh, the prizes for the first three places, uh, and uh, this is commonly known that uh, you will be prized for the three best products. Uh, but also, there is uh, another great surprise from the Brain Tech Company uh, because not only uh, first three places will be granted, but also the funders of the Brain Tech will reward one team whose project is more is most worth uh, the attention and in need of the hardware support uh, because of the real life uh, real chances uh, in soon uh, real life applications. So. Um, before presenting the actual awards, um, I would like to fill you in a little bit with the knowledge about this company and what can uh, it uh, propose uh, for you. So, BrainTech is a company established by the scientists, led by uh, our previous uh, prelegant uh, professor Piotr Durka from University of Warsaw and Faculty of Physics, and of course uh, Maciej Pavlisz, uh, who is an engineer and computer scientist. Well, uh, they kicked off with the first demonstration of a brain uh, computer interface in Poland in 2008. Mm, additionally, uh, this, uh, this company has a world-class tools for, of course, the signal analysis fitted to all kinds of research and brain-computer interface projects and applications. Mm. Well, uh, the main conducted projects are connected with a system of alternative communication and research of consciousness disturbance. Mm. Well, uh, they also developed uh, comprehensive EEG and BCI systems, uh, which are based on uh, in innovative equipment, um, like from traditional uh, EEG amplifiers through a comfortable wireless headset um, to a one-of-a-kind uh, blinker uh, for high-frequency SSVLP, uh, which uh, we were talking today um, a few times uh, about. So. Uh, when it comes to uh, the solutions and the amplifiers, headset, and simulation uh, simul stimulators, uh, they offer many different kinds of amplifiers and headsets and stimulators with a prof professional uh, signal quality um, and versatility at reality reality low like. Price. So these technologies are great and comfortable to, to work on. Uh, I can tell you because uh, our scientific club uh, ordered a few of those tools, mm, and thanks to to that we can um, we can apply our ideas very quickly, and we can uh, measure brain activity during uh, many many activities uh, in just a very quick and simple way. Uh, but I would like to tell you more about three of them. So, uh, first of all, uh, we will start uh, with uh, the uh, Perun uh, 32, uh, which is uh, um, um, like an amplifier uh, with uh, seven independent bipolar channels for EMG, EEA and ECG recordings. So, it is also fitted for uh, GSR measurement and um, when it comes to the examples of applications. So these are very broad. So uh, first of all, of course, the scientific research, uh, neuromarketing, um, like uh, assessive technologies, and so of course, brain computer, uh, brain uh, interfaces. 
Um, secondly, uh, this is also uh, a tool uh, which uh, was mentioned before. So um, it is worth to say that um, this, the blinker, uh, which is offered by Braindeck, uh, is the only device in the world for the accurate generation of any visuals, vi visual stimuli evoking uh, SSVEP potentials and when it comes to what ha what can you do with it of course you can um, uh, design uh, SS SSVAP based brain computer interfaces and uh, research uh, on various aspects of visual uh, visual attention uh, the third <clears throat> sorry the third thing uh, I would like to uh, tell you about uh, is the uh, headset which is uh, very unique. I mean, um, it consists of uh, a wireless amplifier and, of course, water-based electrodes, so no more gel is needed for you to conduct a, a research or a EEG um, acquisition. Mm. Okay, so uh, moreover, this uh, this company uh, has a complex uh, software and complete systems uh, fitted for learning laboratory, with our, which is the implementation of an EEG and PCI learning uh, and uh, research and experimental work, uh, which is a comprehensive software for EEG recording and EEG BCI experiments in terms of uh, a lot of um, like. Uh, visual and uh, auditory and touch and uh, hearing stimulus um, so this is also very uh, very interesting and uh, additionally uh, the brain tech company also offers uh, software and com complete systems for um, alternative communication system for people suffering from the locked-in syndrome which uh, was also mentioned before and this Farag um, software which is a uh, really great bioelectrical signal viewer uh, in the FOSS world. So uh, the Spark makes it possible to record and view signals online using uh, the video EEG and task. So as you can see, um, the company has a lot of to offer and uh, the thing they will offer to you is the special price uh, which will be uh, which uh, which will be uh, given to the one team uh, whose project is um, more for worth attention, who is most probable to being applied in real life. So the company really wants and take care of uh, of you uh, in terms of applying your ideas. Uh, of course, the hackathon is all about uh, the atmosphere, the people, connections, but it is also worth to um, develop great ideas. And we are hoping that uh, we will see those great ideas on your presentation on Sunday. And uh, so here, uh, as a winner uh, of the uh, special prize, you will be able to rent one of those uh, sets for free uh, for a month. Uh, but uh, if um, yeah, like if you will be making progress working on your project using uh, using those brain tech technologies, uh, the renting time can be extended to to two months. But uh, the decision depends on the person uh, renting the equipment. So um, if we can see that uh, your project is going well and it's developing, uh, so the time of uh, Renting the, the technologies uh, is also possible to be extended. Uh, well, you can uh, you can choose um, like the first uh, option is the um, Blinker uh, plus Peron 8. So this is very similar to uh, Peron 32, but here we have eight EEG channels. Or uh, instead of Peron 8, you can uh, choose uh, the headset, which I also uh, mentioned uh, before. So, uh, well, yes, this was uh, our special announcement. So this will be a special prize uh, apart from the first three places. And one of uh, the projects also will be will be granted uh, by uh, the Neurotech, uh, sorry, but by, uh, by the uh, Braintech. And um, 
uh, we are hoping that uh, it will give you more motivation to work and to know that it is really important to uh, like think of those projects as something uh, which is uh, possible to apply and possible to um, to work on uh, for more than like 24 for hours. So uh, now is the time for the coffee break uh, and I guess that we hear each other uh, in uh, 20 minutes uh, from now uh, on the next uh, lecture. So uh, hear you soon and thank you for your attention.
Okay, so hello everyone and welcome after uh, our first break. So now we're heading to uh, the second uh, part of our uh, lectures and uh, now I'm happy to introduce you our next speaker, uh, Professor Jacek Matulewski, uh, with his speech, uh, Gaze-Based Human-Computer Interaction. So Professor Matulewski is a, a physicist and computer scientist with habilitation in quantum optic. Uh, so he specialized in stimulating uh, the evolution of quantum systems interacting with strong laser light. Uh, additionally, he manages the Therapeutic Games Laboratory Game Lab, uh, which is the part of the Neurocognitive Laboratory at the Center for Modern Te Interdisciplinary Technologies at the Nicolaus Copernicus University. Mm, well, he also designs, creates, and tests therapeutic games, uh, creates software for experimental and clinical research, uh, as well as uh, this, as well as software that uh, uses uh, the visual interaction uh, using eye trackers. So, including and including it for the people with uh, disabilities, of course. Uh, in addition to the published books on programming, he has also prepared uh, a series of articles for the uh, PC World uh, magazine. So, uh, uh, Professor, can we uh, hear? Uh, can we hear each other? We can. Okay, uh, great. So now I will stop sharing my screen and uh, enable uh, this to you. Uh, so uh, please uh, present your presentation. Okay, everything is seen. Uh, so stay tuned. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me. My name is Jacek Matulewski. And I would like to talk about gaze-based uh, human-computer interaction. The first and fundamental question is, uh, is it useful or why should we use it? And the answer is, we shouldn't. There is no need. It is always, always less convenient than standard methods for controlling the computers, for example, keyboard or, or mouse. But there is a certain group of people which has no other options. So they have no choice. Uh, how? Uh, we use eye trackers, uh, eye tracking uh, devices, which are simply speaking infrared cameras. I will tell uh, about it later. And uh, the core of my, or, or, of, of my presentation is just presenting several applications developed by uh, students under my supervision and uh, some current projects uh, which are uh, which are developed by uh, IT students as well as by uh, cognitive science students. So uh, at the end I will show some because we uh, I, I create this application not for uh, well, I have always in mind disabled people, which are the target of this application, but uh, at the moment we develop them rather for the experiments. So I will show you some uh, example, uh, example of the results from our experiments. These are the students, uh, limit only to diploma students, which was involved or are involved in my projects. So as you can see, these are students from my faculty, Faculty of Physics, Astronomy and Informatics, <clears throat> as well as students from Cognitive Science, from Faculty of Philosophy and Social, Social Science. <clears throat> Sorry. So the typical scenario is that something uh, terrible is happening. I mean, car, car accident or stroke or something, some other uh, disease which leads to a coma and uh, awaking from the coma is uh, completely not similar to, uh, to the awaking from the sleep because it lasts for several uh, weeks or months, after which the person uh, requires the rehabilitation, which takes some periods of activity during the day. But the most of the day is just laying in the bed with no stimulation with no communication, 
and thus it very often uh, leads to some to, to anhedonia or depression. So our maybe pompous uh, goals are to bring back the control over the environment to the disabled people. By environment, I mean, for example, controlling of the bed, rising and lowering the bed, or control over the, the TV set or window opening, or some other uh, devices in, in, in room. The, another one is restoring interaction with family and community. We, we are talking about people uh, which do not control the body muscles, but the muscles uh, of the attached to the eyeballs. Six muscles for every eye, uh, which can be uh, controlled. So the gaze communication is possible, but there is no other way. If one can control any muscles, any other muscles of the body, it is always better choice to use it than the gaze uh, interaction, gaze communication. And in the end, we would like to restore well-being by delivering just fun or entertainment. So, uh, how how can we do it? We use eye trackers, which are, as I said. Simply speaking, the infrared cameras. They uh, record the face, especially the eyes, looking for pupils and glints. Glints are necessary to make this, all, this whole technique independent on the head movements. So we can detect the gaze in frame of screen coordinates. And then one can use it, for example, after analysis, after finding the, the fixation saccades, blinks, and uh, smooth pursuits, and other uh, gaze movements. Uh, one can use it for experiment, or for diagnosis, or for looking for some signs of awakening, for example. But this scenario is not so uh, interesting for us. We would like to create some look back between the uh, user and the application and uh, use the gaze as a uh, controller for, for game controller, application controller, or experiment controller. So we can uh, use the gaze to change the content of the screen. So this, is, uh, this makes the gaze, the, the application controller, just like uh, mouse or keyboard or, or gamepad. Okay, and at the bottom we can see four examples of the of eye trackers. The first one, I think it's Miramatrix, which is standing alone. You can put it uh, at some screen, at some monitor, or at some painting, uh, or at some at any stimulus which should be observed by the subject of the experiment. And the second one is the SMI which is attached to the screen. This is typical uh, research eye tracker. The third one is interesting because it is built by my former diploma students uh, from a broken webcam and from glasses. And the fourth is the most important because this is the cheap model of eye tracker for uh, gamers, designed for, for, for gamers which is cheap, which uh, it costs about 150 euros, I think. And uh, we can use them all and others thanks to the abstract layer we created. Uh, this abstract layer, this uh, abstract software layer is very important because it makes our, our, our uh, software independent on hardware details. It's, very, it's really useful. So first, our first project was something called Gaze Controlled Application Framework, which in fact is interpreted to our uh, Gaze Interaction Markup Language. And the idea was to make the uh, development of uh, personalized special software for disabled person cheaper. So we uh, created some language for non-programmers to create simple uh, gaze-controlled application. And the example is communication boards. Uh, we took the design from uh, the Shuttle Foundation and digitalized it 
So we created some communication boards which allow everyday communication, but of course it's very limited. So we developed also some uh, gaze text entry methods or gaze keyboards, which allow one to to write a, 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 any text. And of gaze, gaze controlled buttons, gaze aware buttons, which uh, you need to look longer to activate. It is because uh, the, the gestures which activate some buttons must be very distinct from the uh, from mo eye movements while exploring the, the content of the screen. It is called the midas touch problem. So there should be no situation when you activate some elements just by exploring the content of the screen. So we designed several of keyboards, uh, also some dynamic ones with uh, the buttons which are changing the sizes or moving uh, slightly. Uh, the size is uh, proportional to the probability of being the next letter in the in the world. And uh, other we have a dozen or so of these gaze keyboards. This one, the last one, is uh, based on gaze gestures. Having the gaze text entry method, we can create some mess instant messenger, I mean, uh, communicator. So we, we, we did. And uh, this messenger can, uh, using this messenger, one can send the emails and SMSs. And the trick is that uh, the, the dedicated software is only for for disabled person. The other side of the communication, I mean the receivers, use just common uh, client uh, email clients or or SMS application at uh, their mobiles. So their remote communication is very useful because one can write the message with no time pressure, but the response comes quickly. So it is, it encourages to, to, to communicate, which is very important. Okay, so we can manage contacts. Uh, it is, very, there was some special uh, gaze keyboard, which was only for communicating uh, the emotions. And uh, it was very similar to these uh, communication boards. It is attached. I mean, it, it is it is connected with the the user's smartphone, so the phone number and the mail address is conserved and, and can be used. The fourth application, okay, the fourth application is the desktop application. All of them are desktop application. But this one is uh, dedicated to, it's kind of the web browser, in fact, technically speaking, which is dedicated to YouTube service. So one can watch the, uh, the movies from the YouTube. One can, uh, using uh, gaze with several methods, we developed several methods of video playback controlling and volume controlling. So all this pack, we, I call it fun pack because it's software package for for entertainment. Uh, this uh, this pack is now completed by four other projects currently developed by uh, uh, with some involvement of students from cognitive science and from IT. So the gaze photo browser, which can which allow one to browse the photos uh, on the local drive as well as on some cloud drives, for example, Dropbox and Google Drive. So one can uh, one can browse the photos, one can uh, look for new photos, one can use the webcam to make a new photo, and so on and so on. So this is browsing. One can choose particular one, share it, or zoom in or zoom out and it's of course uh, well i have no family photos here but it's intended to 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 share the photos with the family another project is gaze board games which uh, and 
games with no time pressure. So one can uh, it, one can uh, uh, play checkers, chess, tic-tac-toe, and reversi or other Otello. And the problem is, uh, you have 64 fields on the on the board. So it is quite difficult to activate the one desired field. So I asked students from advanced eye tracking class to design some alternative for this uh, simple standard dwell time user interface. And they did, and the ideas are quite interesting. So I'm, I'm looking for, forward to, to see the final results. The next one is gaze games with time pressure. It's very, very difficult to design uh, gaze interaction in case of uh, time pressure. It's truly, uh, we have some breakout game. It's an old game from Atari, designed uh, among others by Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. So uh, we, we, we check several methods of gaze uh, controlling the this racket at the, at the bottom. And uh, this is not easy. And the last one, uh, gaze TV remote control, is the application which is, well, the, it is the most needed in, and desired application by disabled uh, at the Shuttle Foundation. It is a kind of hospicing. Uh, because the TV is the greatest source of stimulation. So we would like to put some laptop close to the, uh, to the patient. Uh, it has the whole fun pack, among others, the Gaze TV remote control, and uh, two devices are attached, the eye tracker, of course, and some device which is designed by Cesare Wilmanski and created by Cesare Wilmanski, which is uh, simply speaking the infrared light emitter. So we can uh, imitate just common TV remote controllers. And thus, we can uh, control all kinds of TVs, because today there's no TV set without remote control. So we can, uh, of course, various manufacturers use various protocols, but we have it all. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the application. This is the user interface for the application for controlling the and the TV set, one can uh, increase the volume, decrease the volume by using this uh, plus and minus buttons. One can choose the volume directly. One can choose some advanced options, especially uh, switching between night mode and day mode. Of course, there are hundreds of channels available. So uh, we need to provide some method for direct choosing the channel by, uh, by by number. So this is typical dwell time, standard dwell time uh, user interface. You need to activate the button just by looking longer, by staring at the, 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 the region of the button. And this is always uh, the method which calls, which lowers the, the number of mistakes, but it's the longest one. So the alternative is the gaze gestures. And the example of gaze gestures designed by uh, by Lucia Trzeciak, by Miss Lucia Trzeciak, we call it nine dots because you have nine dots as a guidance and you activate these dots in a sequence. And the sequence is, uh, uh, well, so the sequences has some meaning. So you can, you can, for example, uh, rise the volume by one, by three, or by ten. You can lower the volume doing the gesture in opposite direction. You can change the channel number. I mean, move forward and backward. You can, of course, switch on and switch off the TV set and close the app. Okay. Uh, and the last part, I promised to, to show some uh, experimental results. Because, of course, 
we can uh, create some alternative uh, uh, gaze interaction uh, based on gaze gestures, but we have no idea if it is more or less convenient. We know the only thing that the gaze-based uh, human-computer interaction is always less convenient. Or, or mouse, but choosing between various designs must be always uh, the only way to learn which one is better is just the experimental way. So we did some experiment on a gaze text entry. We choose three gaze keyboards: the standard one with button layouts like in uh, QWERTY button layouts, the molecular one. We call it molecular because these buttons are connected using the springs, using the harmonic uh, interactions. So uh, it reacts to, well, when, when one is moving, uh, all others are moving away. Uh, just like in molecular dynamics, so we call it molecular. And the second, uh, the third one is typical for, uh, for uh, interaction with disabled because we lower the number of buttons, uh, making it, uh, well, one can choose uh, first, one can choose the group of letters, and in the second step, one can choose particular letter. So we have two steps, two steps, but the uh, buttons are maybe larger. So it is, uh, of course, more convenient. And we add something called super vowel, which is the diamond sign which replace all vowels on the keyboard. So the buttons may be a little bit larger and uh, it is easier to find the proper way because you know, there's no need to look for the vowels. You have just, just one large super vowel. So we checked, we've done experiment and we checked that uh, the super vowel of first of all, standard interface, I mean, uh, interface uh, with static buttons, which are, which layout is similar to, to, to similar to the physical keyboard, is always the best. But uh, two other keyboards, these alternative uh, keyboards, are not much uh, worse. So the uh, gaze text entry speed is almost equal in case of these uh, gaze keyboards. And super vowel can help, but from the other side, it can be treated as a distractor, especially in case of the standard keyboard. It helps slightly in uh, the two-step keyboard or molecular keyboard, but uh, in case of standard keyboard, there's no important uh, effect. So the, the gaze text entry speed is a typical objective measure of usability of gaze interfaces. I mean, any speed, for example, gaze text entry speed. The other one is, uh, the other one is how many mistakes the subject do. So we, we, we checked that using super vowel, we can lower number of mistakes. So it's, of course, a uh, very nice message. And in the end, uh, it is not my intention to discuss all these numbers, but I would like to use them as a proof to, to some statement. I mean, uh, it, is not, it is not a proper way to develop only one gaze method. For example, one gaze keyboard, which is best. It is always uh, better to develop several methods, for example, several um, uh, gaze keyboards or several methods of uh, controlling the video playback and so on and so on, and uh, allow the user to choose between them. Because various persons with various personality traits uh, may choose various methods of gaze control. So we just allow the user to choose and personalize the, the, the method also. 
So again, these are the list of the students, uh, limited only to the diploma students involved in the projects. And I would like to thank them. I would like to thank you for listening to the talk. And again, thank uh, to the organizers. Thanks you very, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for a great presentation. And uh, we have, of course, some questions to you. Um, so uh, if it's OK, I will start from the first one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if they can guess, maybe to use Oculus Drive and control Avatar or some robot going in real world like in movie Avatar? <laughs> uh, of course, one can use... Uh, uh, it is possible, but it's not convenient. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Okay, so... Uh, have you thought about extending the control system with the eye tracker to new modalities, for example, about confirming the selection of an EEG signal? Uh, the, well, let me... The uh, gaze-based uh, gaze human-computer interaction is always, is, is always less convenient than all other ways. Uh, but... Uh, Taking into account that we use gaze interaction in our everyday communication, mainly for selecting the person which we are talking with, for example. So this uh, gaze interaction, which is called the Xs, uh, it means that I choose the, uh, the user interface element by gaze, but I accept or, or I make the action by mouse or other button or something like that, it is the only possible way that uh, the gaze interaction may be useful for healthy persons. Is it the, uh, uh, so this is my answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next question is, uh, do you think that uh, combining, oh wait, uh, do you think that combining both methods uh, as in a way, uh, complementary ones could improve the efficiency of interaction, for example, during gaming or communication with locked in patients. By combining two methods, you mean uh, eye tracking and brain computer interfaces or uh, what is the second method? Well, I think that uh, it uh, is about BCI systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main problem uh, of eye tracking of, of uh, gaze communication is but the system does not know if you explore the screen or just want to select something. And brain uh, or EEG or some other uh, brain computer interface can distinct be between these two processes. So combining these two, and there are some papers about it, may be very useful, yes. Okay, thank you a lot. Uh, I don't see any uh, more questions. Um, okay, so thank you once again uh, for being much. here and for your lecture. It was a pleasure to, to hear it from you. Thank you once again, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I think that we can uh, go uh, through our next speaker. Uh, who? Let me first uh, share my screen. Um, Okay, um, uh, well, yeah, so uh, our first speaker, uh, sorry, our next speaker uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Karolina Fins, uh, who is a graduate of Cognitive Science and Doctor of Exact and Natural Sciences uh, in the discipline of the Physical Sciences. Uh, currently, she's, uh, she is an assistant professor at the Center for Modern Interdisciplinary Technologies and the Nicolaus Copernicus University, and the leader of the Compu Computational Neuroimagining Team and member of the Center of Excellence, Dynamics, Mathematical Analysis, and Artificial Intelligence Neuroinformatic Group. Um, when it comes to her uh, research interests, uh, they are focused on the study of the 
neuroplasticity of the human brain during learning processes, and in particular, the, uh, the re reorganization of its network of connections. Uh, so she's um, involved in the development of open source uh, scientific software and popularizes knowledge in the field of neuroimagining, data science analysis, and open science. So. Let me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Fins with her lecture, uh, Understanding the Brain's uh, Ecosystem. Uh, hello, can we hear each other? Uh, can oh, you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. I stopped presenting my presentation okay. and... Okay, so that it will be fine. So thanks a lot, Sasha, for a nice introduction. I'm very excited to be here and I'm really happy to speak about something that's very fascinating to me. Um, okay, um, so yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, can you okay. see the screen? Yes, 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 yes. Everything is well seen. Okay. Um, well, so, uh, so maybe we can start with a short thought experiment. Um, and to do this, because it's very difficult to explain it on a slide, so I would like to uh, ask you for closing your eyes and I will explain you the experiment. Uh, so imagine that you are a, a spy um, in a company and your uh, task is to investigate other company uh, which just emerged on the market. And this company is very mysterious because everything the company creates is very well done it's a high quality very creative and no one knows how it works because there's no contact with the boss of the team no contact with employees and like no description on the website so your task as a spy is to make an investigation to see how this company works and your boss gives you very expensive equipment that you can use to to see how this company can operate so for example you have a machine who can scan the building and you can see how the building is structured where that are the rooms where are the people and other machine helps you to investigate oxygen intake in the rooms so this is like very crazy instruments and yeah but it's you see something, but it doesn't tell you why the company produces such excellent products. So then you figure out that maybe you can do something with this uh, company. Maybe you can sort of uh, interrupt its uh, behavior. So you put a uh, huge uh, speakers in front of the company and put some noise and see if this somehow changes the output of th this company. And it does like changes, but not the big ones. And so then you think maybe you can uh, show something like you can put something in front of company's doors, but it also doesn't change that much the behavior of the company. So you're kind of desperate and decide to um, pick some uh, employee from the company who is just run like going to home. And you ask the employee, well, tell me, how this company works. Maybe, you know, it's such an excellent company. Can you tell me? And the employee tells you that, you know, I don't know, actually. I just do what I have to do. And you're puzzled. You decide to, at the end, you decide to kidnap some, you know, employees and to see if this changed how company works. But it also doesn't change that much because company is, even if initially, the change is visible, then after a very short time, you notice that everything goes back to normal. Uh, so, yeah, so I think you can now open your eyes. <laughs> and so now I want to, to tell you that actually what we do with the brain, how we study the brain, it's uh, such a situation. So we know that the brains are excellent. We know that they produce amazing things and they are very mysterious. But what we can do, we can only look from the outside and you can scan brain in the fMRI scanner. We can take some neurons and see how they behave, but it doesn't tell us how this brain operates, operates and creates a, such a great uh, behavior. 
So that's because the brain uh, is not like a computer. Um, the brain is self-organizing system. And the brain, there's a lot of self-organizing systems in the world. So, so the brain is one very sophisticated example. But we all know the example of uh, ants colony, where different many thousands, millions ants interact in the colony. And we also see, can see that colony behaves in a very intelligent way. It responds to environmental change. Um, it uh, evolves, but we cannot see uh, from the point of single ant how this whole system is created. So we have to look at the old, um, old interaction between ants to see something. And finally, you can scope, you can uh, zoom out and to see that such uh, systems are observed globally. We can observe such an uh, organization when looking at the, ec at the ecosystem. So we can see how different species of animals interact between themselves, how uh, climate change uh, influence uh, the adaptation of the system. Um, so yeah, so here you have a short definition of their organization. And this is important that what we see, this behavior, what we see is something that emerge from a collective interaction between parts of the system. Yes, yeah, so, so the, these interactions make the system so intelligent. Uh, a few weeks ago, so that's, that's a basic inspiration for my today's talk uh, a few weeks ago as a relax i watched a very nice documentary which is called which was called intelligent trees um, so there's a very great uh, scientist uh, susan simard uh, who works in canada so she studies forests and she makes a very sophisticated experiments uh, so she looks how diff like when trees are growing how they interact between each other because he discovered she discovered that uh, there are fungus that connects roots of trees, that they can help each other to exchange nutrition. And that's ex exactly how whole fo forest interacts. So whole forest forms a network of interactions between trees that help each other to adapt to the environment. And she also uh, presented uh, such a picture during, uh, I think that was her TED talk, and that sort of remind me my PhD thesis, and that was like flashback uh, to me, where I studied how the brain network is organized because it's very similar to what she saw, uh, what she displayed on her presentation. So he, she also showed that uh, there are certain trees that are very highly connected, the hubs of the network, and they are fastest in response to environmental change, some disasters and they spread the information to other trees that they can produce some chemicals to defend themselves. So that was very insp inspirational for me. Uh, so, so you can see such graphs when studying different networks. So forest is a one example. We can study also the brain as a network. Uh, so this is example that I study. Uh, but you can also study social network. It's very, also very exciting to see how people interact between each other. Um, so the very interesting thing is that this uh, network has a non-trivial topological features. Non-trivial, it means that this is not like the network is random. And that's a very beautiful thing about real world network that they are not random. And there's also, um, a uh, field of study that study complex network. And um, so to study complex next network, we have to create a graph, which is constructed of nodes. So element of the net, like basic element of the net uh, network, it can be tree, it can be brain region, it can be person. And the network, this, these nodes are connected with edges and um, these edges can be connections uh, between neuro neuronal connections. It can be some uh, uh, chemical interaction, can be some uh, social interactions. So 
the very beauty of this um, area of studies is that it's very universal because every network has something has something similar have some similar properties and basically most of the networks have have very similar pro properties and so how we can construct such a graph because we have to represent the graph somehow in a computer so we can have to tell computer how our network looks like so we don't draw uh, you know like graphs we define our network as adjacency metrics. It's very easy. So if we have a uh, node of the network, uh, we create a matrix where, so each uh, row and column represents a node of the matrix. And when there is connection, we put a one in the matrix. So as you can imagine, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, network can be also directed. So some, so it's, it may, does, maybe it doesn't work that this is only like one side, a connection to another side, that maybe there's only like one way connection and that there's no way back. So this is also possible. And then the matrix is non-symmetrical. And of course, there are more possibilities that you can store in this matrices weights. So you can tell the computer which um, net, which connect, connect, connections are more, uh, strong so this uh, connections which are more strong have a higher number so this number can also um, represent the, the number of connections so there are many possibilities so you basically can see that uh, like this very complicated graph can be represented in a way of sim simple 2d metrics uh, so yeah so i said that there are some properties of real real world networks that uh, are very common so I want to speak about a little bit, a bit about them. And first of all, I want us to speak about small wordness. You may, you might uh, hear about this. It, it is very, I think, intuitive to us to understand because because we all often say the word that you know this, the world is so small when we meet someone you know in the city. Um, it's very like it's kind of surprising that's you know that's should not happen in like when when the world like when the connection social connection connections were, were were random that would probably not happen so that because this world is uh, organized in a way like social network brain network other complex networks are organized in a way that they have a very short path um so uh, stan milgram a uh, scientist um uh, I think a social scientist uh, perform a such experiment that he asked people to, uh, so he sent a letter to one person and he asked this person to send this letter to concrete person. And the person doesn't know that was a random person that the person doesn't, didn't know. And he noticed that, so he wanted to see what's the path between uh, this person in, and other person. So this person can send uh, the letter to other person that he might think that it might know that the end person. And uh, and again, this uh, like whole chain of letters were continued. And he measured that um, such a path between one person in United States to, to the end person is about six degrees. And this is a very, very short path. You can imagine that I think in Facebook even, it's a very, it's even shortest. So it's like a four steps between you and uh, like some, I don't know, United States uh, president um, on Facebook. So for short, for, for natural uh, social networks, a bit uh, longer, but for Facebook, it's even shorter. <clears throat> And also you can see that the brain is organized in a such way. So it's not a totally random. It's also not a, in a way, it's organized in a way that is totally regular. So it has a, like every node has a, the same number of connections. It's more something in between. So it's a, like the, there's a lot of nodes that have the same or similar number of connections, but there are also some nodes that uh, connects very distant uh, people and they so, sort of uh, play a role as an integrator of the of the system 
So yeah, so we can observe the same property in the brain and also in, in social networks and biological networks and forest network. So other very important uh, property of complex networks is a modularity. And even more, it's a modularity that also has a hierarchy. So we can observe that the brain can be, and also social network and other networks can be divided in a sort of communities. So there are some groups of people who, who are, who, who, who know themselves like each other well. And also in the brain, the groups of brain regions that are talking to each other more often than other regions. Um, so this is also a very important property. And this also tells us a lot about how this uh, brain enterprise works. Uh, another very important property is that a uh, complex network have hubs. Uh, so hub is a node that connects uh, different modules together. So here you can see that, uh, for example, here you, can, you have four nodes and there are some nodes, so four modules and you have some nodes that share connections between nodes that are in different modules. So these this regions um, have, have a role of co connecting different modules together. So this is a very important uh, role of this uh, entity that is make this network um, integrating. And this is also related to something, some, some very interesting um, property of complex systems that are organized so that the distribution of edges in this system uh, follows power law. So if you expect, if you would expect that the brain is, um, the connections in the brain are distributed in random, then you should expect something like this, that you have a lot of uh, connections, that a lot of nodes that have a mean number of connections, and there are also some nodes that have smaller number of connections and some, some nodes that have well, a, little bit, a little bit more connections. But in reality, complex networks look like this, which is also very surprising. And that's not that long time that people uh, discover this. Um, so there's a lot of nodes uh, in the network that have a small number of connections. But there's also possibility to the network that there are some certain nodes that have a lot of connections, like a thousand of connections, like hundreds of connections, that will be not possible if this network will be random. So it's, there's also very um, often, a very often shown example that, for example, when you look at uh, airports uh, in the United States, there are some airports that have uh, many connections, like Chicago or Los Angeles. And it doesn't look like it's, we might expect if this network would be connected in random. Um, yeah. So uh, also I want to tell you a bit how we can create such a network uh, on the brain. So there are many, of course, many ways to create such networks. So I will just uh, restrict myself to tell you more about the human brain. So first of all, we can study structural network, for example, using DTI. Um, and we can create adjacency metrics based on, for example, the number of streamlines between different brain regions. And then you can create graph and adjacency met like and we anal can analyze this uh, with uh, network science tools. But we can also study uh, functional connectivity, and it also doesn't um, like we can use different um, um, methods to do this. We can use EEG, we can use fMRI, we can use other methods. So the key idea is that we know that we can track a time series of activity in different brain regions, and then we create, calculate similarity or correlation between this um, activity. And then this correlation matrix is our adjacency matrix. And then we further can study this functional brain networks. And also at the end, I wanted to tell you some 
research that shows so what you learned so far because this area of this also there's a new field of study which is called network neuroscience uh, which was coined, I think, uh, four years ago. Uh, so what we learned so far using this network science tools on the brain um, data. So I think the most important thing that we learned is that the brain, functional brain network, change, change its organization from different in when we are doing different tasks. For example, our network is different when we are resting. Our network is different when we do some motor task and also when we do working memory task and also changes depending on the difficulty of the task in a way that uh, when the when we perform more difficult tasks our brain has to integrate and we have more connections that connects different uh, distant modules in the brain and also very exciting area of this research shows that actually brain functional connectivity constantly changes so we can see fluctuations so some at some moments the brain is very segregated and in some other moment the brain is very integrated so i think this is very very interesting and also very uh, interesting research shows that um this is not only that the brain is dynamic and changes during the task but it also the network also changes when we learn so, for example, when we learn a motor sequences, uh, network starts to be more segregated. So, when we have uh, this visual motor motor network, they initially interact between each other, but at, after the training, they are very separated. And this also means that the network is, is more efficient because it doesn't have to waste so much energy for integration. And also our study shows that the same happening when we have a working memory training. So also in others, totally different tasks. When we look at networks which are important for the task, we see the same separation. So that the network is more established, more separated, more consistent within its modules and less integrated. And finally, I wanted to uh, recommend you some resources if you want to uh, learn more about network science and network neuroscience. And first of all, there's a very nice book by Albert Lashlo Barabasi uh, called Linked. And this is more popular science books, which I really recommend you to read. It's very, very fascinating. And there's also a great uh, handbook, but also by Albert Lashlo Barabasi. So he, he's, uh, he discovered the uh, scale free a power low, low, low distributed network. So this is very important person for the field. And his book is also uh, online, totally online, that you can read the book for free. And there's also a nice handbook um, about um, specifically brain network analysis. So we can also check this um, book. And yeah, and there's some tools that you can use. Um, so now I'm using for Connectivity, functional connectivity estimation, I mostly use Nylon, uh, which is a Python toolbox, and it offers many uh, methods to calculate connectivity, um, also cluster network into modules, and so on. So uh, you, there are great um, tutorial, tutorials, examples on the website, and I highly recommend you to use it. But if you are more MATLAB person, I also recommend you functional connectivity toolbox that you can used to create connectivity matrices. And there are also some um, specific tools specific for network um, analysis. So for Python, we have a very famous network X and this is a domain general. So you can use it for any network you can imagine. So, so not only the brain. And for the brain, there's a brain connectivity toolbox in MATLAB, uh, and it's written by brain scientists. So it's more like more intended to be um, used for brain networks. And there's also a Python adaptation of this toolbox. You can check, and it's also good. And yeah, so that's all uh, uh, in terms of my presentation.
And I just want to say that I'm uh, always very happy to chat about networks. And yeah, I'm very in love with networks. Um, and yeah, so you can write to me if you are interested. And you can also check uh, the website of our team. And also a small announcement that uh, this year we have a new uh, cognitive science master program in English at Nikolaus Copernicus University. I am I'm, I'm very ex I'm very excited to to teach uh, network neuroscience uh, at that program, and I really recommend you to to check this out. Uh, this is very very great program. A lot of uh, machine learning, um, data analysis, also brain. Um, um, subject. So, so yeah, so I'm very recommended to you. Um, and thank you. Thank you for your great speech and a very great announcement. Uh, I think that this is something what uh, people interested in brain and networks and New York science in Poland needs. So I also very happy about that. About that. Uh, so we have some questions to you. Um, so first of all, uh, let me uh, read those from the chat uh, because, because also we have some from uh, the YouTube. But first of all, uh, can the activity of the default mode network be related to personality disorders? Uh, yeah, default mode network is a network which is very, um, so we have a lot of uh, research showing that is basically important for many um, uh, disorders. Uh, so like depression, schizophrenia, and probably also some personality disorders. So. So the case is that we still don't know what's uh, what's the role of this network. There are different uh, views uh, on this, and so some research shows that it's very related to um, some um, autobiographical memory or some self-referential processes. But also other research, recent recent research, show that it's very important to learning. So of course, probably the I don't know myself research on personality disorders, but. I, I can guess that probably uh, we can expect something in default mode network, which is very important. Like there are a lot of hubs in the network. So, yeah. Mm, okay, thank you. So there is a next question. Um, uh, are we able to follow the learning process through the changes in networks? Yeah, yeah. So th that's exactly what we studied. Uh, so we can do this. Um, so we can do this at different levels. So we can do this at the level of the task. So we can, uh, for example, um, divide task in certain windows and then calculate connectivity within such windows. And then we can construct graphs uh, on these windows. And then we can track how properties changes across time. So this can be done in a one scan during, for example, learning. And people do this, um, but this is also possible to study these changes across scans, how we did this. So we did this both. So we did both in the task and both between uh, sessions. And so you can also like, for example, calculate uh, functional connectivity matrices in uh, uh, first session, second session, third and fourth, and some calculate some network properties and, and then analyze it so you can like there are various um de depending on what you want to test uh, various methods to do this you can look how ch different edges change uh you can look how properties change um so yeah there's like a lot of a uh, lot of possibilities of course it's possible okay and uh, i think this is uh well, from as I saw the last uh, questions, but uh, with uh, which what neuroimagining methods can we find out how to define uh, nodes of the network? So there are some methods which you will be recommend. Yeah, so that's a very good one. Um, yeah, so this is also not uh, there's like not we don't have a gold standard to this because it's also very very uh, young um, uh, discipline. Uh, so what people do, they create atlases, uh, like brain, they are called brain parcellations. Uh, so um, depending on the functions of the different regions, we can um, create such an atlas. So different regions have a different uh, location and we can see that, okay, these voxels uh, are related to, I don't know, um, some functions because mostly they're active together, 
other nodes are in some other parts. So we have this, this basically we have an atlas that covers whole the brain. And then we can use this atlas uh, to mask uh, our brain scan, uh, fMRI brain scans and ext extract uh, time series from this uh, parcels, this, this brain region. So, and that's what, how we do this. Um, there are many uh, atlas. It also depends what you want to do, what questions you have, what you want to achieve, and it depends how you define this node. But you also can define this node based on some previous research, uh, some activations um, you ob obtain, some coordinates you have from the paper. So there are a lot of different possibilities. Okay, thank you. I, I can see that we have uh, one more question, but sadly we don't have uh, time to answer it like now. So as I previously said, uh, if it's possible, I will send you the question and maybe you could provide us an answer. To, so I will direct the answer to, to our participants. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank, thank you. you once again for your speech. It was great and very inspiring. Uh, and I hope that uh, there are people who will uh, text you because like, this is great. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Bye. Okay, um, well, uh, so now, uh, oh, uh, Karina, could you um, stop sharing your screen, please? Sure, thank you. So uh, I'm happy to welcome our next uh, speaker. Um, oh, let me, uh, let me uh, share my screen. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Anna Anzulevich. Uh, Dr. Anna deals with broadly understood cognitive psychology, uh, in particular the subject of uh, the relationship between attention and uh, visual awareness. Uh, from the beginning of her scientific career, she has been associated, associated with the Consciousness Research Laboratory of the uh, Jagiellonian University in Poland, and she's also interested in the um, practical aspects of knowledge uh, about perception. Uh, in addition to experience in research, she also has uh, experience in working in interdisciplinary projects combining science and business. So. Um, additionally, she's a co uh, she is a co-founder of uh, Harimata, a company that creates technological solutions uh, supporting the detection of disorders in children and supporting the therapy of the youngest. Um, and now I'm happy to uh, tell you uh, the uh, title of her speech. So uh, what does the movement tell us about the mind and discovering human behavior from wearable sensors and smartphones? So uh, Anna, can we hear uh, each other? Uh, hello, hi. Can okay, you hear me? hello. Great. Yes, of course. I'm stopping sharing, stop sharing my screen so you could uh, show your presentation, please. Great, so just give me a second. Let, sure. let me find my, my presentation. Okie dokie. Can you see it now? Uh, not yet, uh, not, not yet. yet. Just a second then. Okay. Still nothing. Oh, okay. So, let me, so let me do it again. Sure. Can I help you somehow? Uh, uh, yeah. Like I, I don't know what is happening, but um. I've lost my co cursor, so uh, just a second, I think. Okay, that, sure. Uh, maybe I, I should switch the, br the browser. Maybe that would be the easiest way to go. Okay, okay, just, so we will wait. Just a second, please.
So in the meantime, uh, I sent you on Discord link to uh, the form uh, connected with our integration. So if you are interested in joining us after uh, today's sessions of uh, speakers and uh, mentors and some workshops, uh, so please fill it in and we'll be in touch later to talk to each other and to know better each other and to maybe inspire you for uh, the next uh, tasks which uh, will be announced tomorrow. Uh, and well, additionally, we also uh, will provide you a guidebook uh, with all the uh, requirements for the projects, uh, mentors, descriptions, product descriptions, the prices, uh, which uh, you could possibly won, uh, will, uh, win. And, um, everything there will be described. So uh, stay tuned about those information, about those information and uh, we will provide it to you uh, soon. Okay, I'm back. Uh, okay. And hopefully now it will work. Yes, yes, we can see, we can oh, hear okay. you. So great, stage is okay. yours. Thank you very much, that's perfect. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, sorry for the technical problems and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I, uh, I am really happy to uh, tell you a bit about my research that I've been doing for like a couple of years now. Uh, so, my, my background is in cognitive si uh, science and uh, data science, uh, but uh, I'm very interested in something that is uh, not found very sexy by many re researchers, that is movement. And I really like studying movement uh, because it tells us a lot about uh, how our minds work. And uh, why? Um, well, that's quite simple because uh, motor, motor behavior requires and reveals the workings of, of the mind. Uh, that is a quote from, from the great Esther Fellen. Uh, and uh, she and her work is uh, is a really great ins inspiration for me. And uh, today I want to show you two of, of the projects uh, I've been working on uh, for some time now. And I will show you how uh, we can approach uh, like the study of movement and why sh should we approach the study of movement. And uh, I will start with this why question. So. Why should we study movement uh, in the first place? Because motor, like motor activity and uh, motor development uh, in particular is closely related to different aspects of, of development and uh, how we behave, how we react uh, to different kinds of stimuli in the world. This is closely linked to how we think, how we perceive, uh, how we um, uh, how we interact with the world. And uh, even more importantly, there are some specific um, motor deficits, uh, for example, in uh, neurodevelopmental disorder like uh, autism spectrum disorder, other disorders as well. Uh, we know that uh, mood disorders, um, in particular uh, depression, uh, so clinical depression uh, is linked to some particular changes in behavior. And this is uh, something that we can study to uh, better understand what is going on uh, on an individual's mind. And uh, more importantly, even mobile technologies, so um, wearables, um, smartphones, uh, tablet devices, uh, they are everywhere. Uh, and all those technologies uh, have those uh, teeny tiny sensors that are very precise and uh, they can help us a lot uh, measuring movement. And uh, we can track behavioral dy dynamics in real time and also in longer stretches of, of time. So it's, uh, it's more complicated and more complex that, than what we typically do in psychological studies. And uh, that's also uh, like because it's uh, uh, you know it, it, it's very it's very nice and it's very uh, important uh, what technologies do i mean exactly uh, for many years uh, motion capture systems were mostly used for uh, for capturing movements and uh, 
Uh, this uh, this is a very nice uh, technology, of course, uh, but the problem is that uh, um, but the problem is that uh, those technologies are quite uh, ex expensive. Uh, they are difficult to uh, to get, uh, and uh, you, you basically need the whole lab with, with the camera system uh, to like to to have this sort of uh, studies. Uh, and uh, right now it's getting uh, much more easy because uh, we got all these um, uh, mobile sensors. Uh, so these wristbands or uh, like those uh, uh, bands that you can see uh, in this photo. So in this photo, uh, there is uh, Anya and her son, uh, uh, Oleg. And Oleg, uh, both Anya and Oleg are wearing uh, those uh, bands, so they have these uh, black bands with sensors, and uh, those those are ultralight sensors that allow us to track in real time the movement of of the baby and uh, and, and the parent, and we can um, infer all sorts of um, uh, interesting stuff uh, just by looking at uh, how this movement uh, of of the baby is related to the movement of uh, of the parent. Pretty cool. Uh, we have also um, a lot of uh, uh, tools that are based on uh, video analysis. So uh, typically, uh, DNNs are used for that. So uh, neural networks, of course, uh, are great, but the problem is that they require a lot of data. And in psychological experiments, it, it's not always possible to get uh, this amount of data. Uh, that's why uh, we typically use uh, um, sensors, uh, as, uh, at least for, for the moment. Uh, yeah, and here you have uh, this example of, of a mo motion capture setup. So uh, this is a baby uh, with uh, like this uh, nice track suit with, uh, with uh, reflective markers and uh, we need a whole like set of cameras to, to actually um, to actually uh, record this this movement of the of the, of the child, so um, maybe not very problematic, but but very very expensive. And uh, uh, I uh, want to uh, tell you about uh, a project that uh, was not, um, like was based on mobile sensors, but in a, a different uh, way. Well, let's say because this was a project that was based on tablets. Uh, uh, we used tablets uh, to measure um, behavior of uh, of children. So th these were children um, like in this like from in uh, in this uh, age range from three to six. So um, basically uh, kindergartners, and the aim of this project was to uh, see whether it is possible to uh, find this. Uh, motor or like movement signature uh, that would suggest that uh, a child can can be on the autism spectrum. So this is what I'm going to uh, tell you about in a second. And then I, I will briefly tell you about uh, uh, our like next project, the, the most recent one. Uh, it's a sapiens project and uh, this project is uh, about uh, uh, understanding motor and cognitive development of uh, of the baby in the first year of life, and in this project we uh, use different measures of uh, coordination. So we measure this coordination uh, between a parent uh, and the and the baby to uh, better understand development, um, because development doesn't proceed uh, like you know on this individual level but on uh, on this you know family social level and we should also take it into account uh, in our studies uh, okay so I, i'm going to start uh, with this uh, with this placer project so um, i did this uh, as a part of the research that i was doing with my startup uh, harimata uh, and uh, it was um, also done in collaboration with uh, Lab for Innovation in Autism in uh, Strathclyde University, Glasgow, and uh, in collaboration with, with uh, Baby Lab uh, at the University of Warsaw. Uh, and uh, this is a place where, where I'm working uh, right now. So it's also, it's also great. And um, before I tell you about this, this uh, 
project, like the nitty gritty of this project, I would like to tell you a bit about autism. So uh, autism, as you might uh, know, uh, it is um, some uh, a typical way that brain can develop. So is uh, uh, autistic brains uh, are neurodivergent brains. And um, well, they they basically process like the information about their world in a, a different way than uh, than neurotypical brains do. Uh, so uh, there are those very typical problems that uh, or those challenges that uh, are very widespread um, uh, in autistic uh, individuals. So there are um, like different. Um, the different uh, like sorts of like different types of communication are used. So uh, autistic children typically have uh, problems with verbal communication, uh, also poor social interaction. Um, there are also some repet repetitive behaviors and uh, uh, some very strict uh, uh, strict uh, preferences. Uh, that are that are uh, very very typical, and uh, uh, sensory processing issues. So, um, like this, people with autism typically uh, might have some troubles uh, with uh, like, like too much light, too too much sound, uh, like th this sorts of problem. Sorry, and uh, the thing is that uh, autism is. Uh, it's not a single disorder. I, I wouldn't even say it's it's a disorder. It's a typical uh, it's some atypical way of uh, brain wiring, uh, uh, and uh, well, it, it, its causes are on all only partly known, and those uh, those causes are most mostly genetic. Uh, autism cannot be, be cured because it's not a disease, uh, but uh, like it's very important to give um, like these people with uh, with autism or on the autism spectrum, uh, sufficient care and this care should be available uh, very early in development. So this early intervention is key. And uh, the problem is that uh, most of, of the children on the spectrum are diagnosed under, after the age of four. So it's it's very late. So so it is too late for uh, for uh, an early intervention, but uh, like. You know, better late than never. Uh, but still, uh, we we need to, uh, you know, go lower with this um, with this uh, age. And uh, we need this early detection to uh, to help uh, like those children get early intervention. But the problem is that autism assessment is quite problematic. We have. Uh, uh, different uh, screening tools and uh, we have um, psychometric tools uh, for observation, for parental interviews, and we have this uh, requirements for formal assessment. Um, but uh, it is still uh, problematic because um, sometimes it takes uh, like it takes a very long time to uh, get a diagnosis. And this diagnostic process requires many visits and um, um, sorry, some, something disappeared here, but uh, uh, many children don't go into the diagnostic process at all. For example, uh, for example, girls and women uh, on the autism spectrum are uh, very often misdiagnosed or not diagnosed uh, after, until the you know high school or or even um, well into their adulthood. So it's very important to get this uh, assessment very very early, and. Um, this approach to uh, to the problem that uh, we took with with our team was to make this screening uh, easier. Uh, so uh, we want to we wanted to make a change at this level of uh, uh, of uh, of assessment. So without uh, like before this formal formal diagnosis, we need this pre screening and. Uh, we wanted to make it as objective as, as possible because previously, mm, like this pre-screening was uh, like done sol solely based on uh, subjective uh, measures. And um, this different approach we took was based on movement analysis. Uh, and 
this uh, this very in interesting phenomenon and uh, we've you know we've known that for for, for many years uh, actually but uh, it is not something that was uh, widely studied uh, because like studying it was uh, was difficult and uh, quite expensive uh, back in the days uh, but we know that children with autism and uh, adults with autism so autistic people have specific um, movement difficulties so they have some specific uh, problems in uh, in this control of uh, voluntary movements uh, and um, this can be translated to different kinematic patterns that um, can be found um, in, uh, in in uh, autistic individuals and uh, compared to typically developing children or adults we can uh, uh, we can see those differences so uh, for example in this in this um, in this figure uh, you can you can see um, two uh, types of um, uh, kinematic patterns. So one pattern is uh, uh, this pattern that is related to uh, autism, like autistic movement, and the other two uh, like neurotypical movement. So uh, this is uh, like a very simple task of uh, like moving you know, moving the arm um, in this controlled way. Uh, but even with this easy task, we can uh, we can find differences. Uh, and I, I'm, I won't be going into the details of, of the theory behind, but um, in general, uh, you know, the, the idea is that we cannot, uh, as, as children, as babies, we cannot learn about the world around us without uh, interacting with this world. And if we have some motor problems uh, or uh, some problems with um, motor feedback, uh, it leads to all sorts of problems uh, like this disrupted um, uh, you know, intention and um, in turn it might lead to disrupted social and affective engagement, which is uh, one of the core elements of autism. And uh, the other thing uh, that is important in the study is that uh, we wanted to use uh, technology that uh, was like very child friendly. So we used tablets uh, to make this whole assessment uh, less stressful. Uh, and the whole process easier for 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 the families for for children and to to have fun for for the kids to have fun but researchers as, as well uh, so uh, the, these were the requirements that we had um, we wanted to use um, some uh, simple but very nice and fun games uh, with a very short short long play not more than 15 minutes and uh, then uh, we wanted to uh, have this technology that would allow us to uh, to um, actually analyze this uh, this motor patterns very very quickly and give us some results. Uh, so here we have this example of um, one of of the games, um, and as you can see, it's it's not like a typical uh, like cognitive task. It's it's just a game with with feedback with visual feedback. Uh, we have uh, like all sorts of elements here. Uh, we have all the distractors. So those, for example, those lamps or this this rubber duck in the back. This is something that you can uh, you can tap and uh, like uh, you know switch on and off the light. And these are all sorts of distractors. So we can check whether a child is more interested in uh, like doing the uh, the the main task. Uh, or is more focused on on other things in the app. Uh, the other app is uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's very simple. It's all about uh, just uh, following the the outline. So you need to draw this shape. So uh, in this case, it's a squirrel. And then after you know this uh, this outline is completed, uh, you need to uh, fill it with shapes. So I'm going to skip that. Okay, so here we have this color wheel. Yeah, and basically uh, this is it. And during the whole gameplay, we collected uh, data from screen sensors, uh, from the gyroscope and accelerometer, and we also analyzed game flow. Uh, long story short, um, with this setup, we, we've done um, three, actually right now it's four studies. So uh, we've got uh, this uh, four studies in four countries with uh, more than 1,000 participants. 
and uh, a part of it was uh, was a clinical diagnostic trial uh, that was done in in the UK and in Sweden. And uh, uh, yeah, basically, uh, uh, we we don't have uh, like m much time to uh, go through the like this whole process. But uh, what I wanted to uh, tell you that uh, we achieved a really high results. So in the first study, in the first study, we used uh, data from 100 children. So uh, not that much, uh, not that many for uh, for machine learning to uh, to be very helpful. Uh, but 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 still, uh, we managed to get 94% uh, accuracy in uh, this identification like, or this classification between atypical and uh, typical uh, motor patterns. Uh, in a larger study uh, with uh, like more than 500 participants, uh, we got uh, uh, around 80% sensitivity and 89% uh, specificity. Uh, so it uh, might seem not that high, uh, but it's still higher than uh, like most of this uh, pres prescreening uh, questionnaires and the thing is that um, this tool is uh, is completely it's supposed to be completely objective in, in principle because it's not based on uh, like some subjective assessment of uh, for example a parent or, or, or a teacher uh, and um, here uh, I will just uh, briefly show you a heat map that um, demonstrates uh, there's differences in motor patterns that uh, can be measured uh, using uh, this um, mo 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 motion sensors. Of course, it's a it's a simplification, um, but it, it like it gives you an idea. It should give you an idea of how it how it works. So um, one picture is uh, is uh, this visualization of of the task done by a neurotypical child and the other one is uh, is done by uh, was done by an autistic child and I guess which is which <laughs> yeah I can uh, I think that you can see it straight away okay so yeah it's it basically looks like that uh, okay so um, another interesting uh, thing is that uh, we replicated with this tablet study uh, the same pattern uh, that was found in a motion capture study. So these kinematic patterns were basically the same uh, as in, in motion capture. So it's quite incredible because, um, as you as you as you know, tablets are quite like you you typically don't use them in this 3D mode, but rather in you know you just play around uh, with the screen. Uh, we've done a lot of stuff like with neural networks. So if you're interested in that, I can I can tell you about it afterwards. And we used uh, all, like all sorts of feature sets. So we used uh, either like either this or only this uh, touch data or uh, all sorts of data from uh, accelerometer also and gyroscope. And uh, we got like this like different numbers, uh, but uh, the, like this touch data was was the best. And um, yeah, so like the, the next steps um, after the, the clinical trial is over, so we're still cal calculating the re results. Uh, and we would like to have this, this tool as um, this, uh, like as, as a tool that supports screening, for example, in uh, kindergartens and, uh, um, and, uh, and child clinics. So hopefully that uh, would be something uh, that will be available soon. And um, Yes, in, in principle, it should work like this. So uh, after the gameplay, uh, this uh, movement patterns uh, should be analyzed uh, in, in the cloud using uh, machine learning uh, methods. And then a report is generated to inform the, the doctor or the teacher uh, or the psychologist uh, about the risk of uh, uh, autism or other neurodevelopmental disorders. So that's the that's the main idea uh, but of course uh, this is quite problematic as i said because um you know uh, for a child to play tablet the child has to be uh, two or three year old, year old or years old or, or more uh, and autism like in many cases can be 
uh, can be identified even earlier, e even in the first year of life. Uh, that's why right now we are moving to studying uh, er uh, like young, younger children uh, and children in the first year of life. And uh, we're using this, um, this sort of uh, setup, something that I showed you, showed, showed you at the beginning. Uh, so uh, we want to use these sensors to investigate uh, key aspects, not only of motor, but also vocal inter uh, interpersonal coordination. And uh, we want to use then sampling uh, longitudinal assessment in the first year of life that is done uh, in homes. Not, so not uh, only in the lab setting, but also in, uh, in home, at home. So uh, it is quite challenging. And here are some of our uh, participants. And uh, we're just going through the feasi feasibility uh, study right now, so uh, I hope that uh, you know in a couple of um, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, weeks I will be able to uh, present some some more some data on it. Uh, yeah, and uh, so I can see that I'm running out of time. Uh, I, I would like you to, to I would like you to uh, ask me questions if you have uh, any, and if you uh, would like to know some more things, uh, let me know, we can uh, discuss them afterwards. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your speech. Uh, because we uh, lost those four minutes, uh, I would like to still ask you some questions uh, because we have some. Uh, but first of all, uh, someone on our YouTube channel, actually, uh, she's uh, Katarzyna Kołodziejczyk, uh, wrote that a uh, small word. I was interviewed for uh, a Harimata project a few years ago, but uh, <laughs> It wasn't the one mentioned here, but uh, oh, we oh. have uh, re your receiver here. <laughs> okay. So, indeed, the world is small. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> small. Okay, but uh, when it comes to the questions, so um, what solutions come to your mind in the context of adapting the educational space, uh, for example, in the museum to people with autism or uh, uh, ADHD. Mm -hmm. uh, like as a part of uh, like uh, uh, having those uh, those uh, places more accessible. Do you mean, or uh, in what context uh, exactly? Mm. Uh, maybe in context, for example, of mm -hmm. uh, watching the exhibition or something, and how we can. Uh, adapt uh, the space mm -hmm. uh, to, to the people with uh, such uh, disorders uh, with autism or something mm -hmm. okay um, uh, yeah so uh, for sure it is not possible to create a space or adjust the space that would uh, you know uh, be good for all uh, autistic individuals because uh, you know there's this saying that if you know one Person, uh, one autistic person, you, you just know one autistic person. You don't know, no, you know nothing about autism, uh, because uh, autism can be very different in in, in different people. So, uh, I think it, you know, we should go towards uh, individualization and personalization of, of these spaces uh, whenever possible. And I, I, I think it's it's the way to go. Actually. Well. Okay, uh, thank you. The next question is, uh, do you think that based on the behavior of a person with autism, a system can be made that uh, could adapt the elements of public space uh, surroundings such as lights and sound they need? So uh, it is somehow uh, connected with, you, with what you said. Uh, but uh, do you think this is possible to actually do this for uh, one specific person to adapt the space? Uh, yeah, I, I I believe that it is possible. I uh, you know actually I some time ago I start, started shifting uh, like from this thinking about like this individual uh, to the, the whole ecosystem that is uh, you know this individual is living in. Uh, so I, uh, I strongly believe that it is possible to, to have this personalization. So we have different kinds of tools, we have technology, and um, this is something um, that can be, I think, uh, can be made uh, like in a couple of, of years even. So it's not that problematic, I would say, in my view at least. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And the last question is uh, connected with the previous one about museum and educational space as well. So do you think uh, it is possible to create one type of solution that fits all um, autism people uh, or we would have to adapt the settings to for every individual? So yeah, so the, the, the yeah. answer is straightforward. Yeah, we need to adapt. We need mm -hmm. to adapt. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I think that uh, there are, uh, these are all questions. Uh, thank you a lot for your speech. It was very uh, interesting and inspiring. So uh, it's really it was really great to have you here with us. Thank you for thank your you lecture. Very much. Thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, so now uh, we have uh, one uh, hour for uh, dinner uh, break. So we see uh, each other at. Mm. We see each other uh, in one hour on uh, our workshops uh, with uh, other great uh, lectures. Uh, so uh, see you and hear you uh, in one hour.
Okay, so uh, welcome everyone after uh, the break. So now we are going to uh, change uh, the topic a little bit because we uh, finished the section with lectures and now we're going straight to the workshops. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that uh, the first uh, a speaker, the first presenter of uh, this uh, third block uh, is uh, Łukasz Furman. Uh, Łukasz is an instructor in the Academy of Fine Arts uh, Intermedia Department uh, in Kraków, in Poland, and he has uh, a, um, above one uh, above ten years of experience and proven knowledge of advanced technology, real time data, and programming. And he's also an uh, experienced designer and uh, UX designer. So uh, Lukash will tell you more about uh, the environments and the tools we can, uh, which you can use uh, potentially for working with the EEG signals. So I think it will be very useful um, to, to listen to uh, this presentation um, inside of uh, work, which uh, you are going to, uh, to perform in the next uh, 24 hours. So now I will stop presenting uh, my presentation and uh, Lukasz, uh, stage is yours. Hello. Hello, Zosia. Hello, all. Uh, thank you for... Uh inviting me here and thank you for uh, like saying a few things around, uh, about me uh, so I will just skip the uh, introduction and uh, just find the button to show you a screen sure okay okay um. okay mm. so I hope you can uh, see the screen uh, yes, we can hear you, we can see your presentation, so thanks, everything is fine. Okay, so uh, just to make sure I will also reduce a bit my camera because it's like uh, my, con my connection becomes sometimes unstable. Uh, so as working on the topic, um, of working with EEG is so uh, like wide bandwidth of aspects you can uh, basically uh, came from. And um, why I um, basically um, wanted to make some kind of presentation uh, and uh, why in a section of the hackathon? Because what I think is like when you've got a really um, close, uh, like a short time period for uh, making uh, any kind of uh, application and prototype of an application, you need to choose the right tools to, to do that. For example, in 24 hours uh, without um, any knowledge you did before, it can be even like programming knowledge, it can be really hard to, to get the concepts uh, to do something to work uh, in, for example, real time while uh, basically uh, doing something with uh, another kind of data uh, can be pretty straightforward because there is a lot of uh, explanation and examples in the internet. And I will try to uh, basically just make that presentation to be uh, as much as it can be informative. Um, and of course, I cannot attach all the software and environment which are grow up in, uh, basically uh, all the time, uh, because there is a lot of uh, ways to to work with the EEG signal. I try to uh, focus on some kind of uh, technologies that are and environments are uh, maybe most used uh, in some areas of working with uh, time series. And also, I will try to introduce to you um, the multi-purpose software toolkits, which can uh, do something with time series. They are not uh, basically um, 
like for the uh, for the uh, maintaining problems are not designed to, to work with EEG, but you can find a way uh, to work with that and find a way to prototype easy uh, some kind of things that are uh, becoming a rocket science in like easy stuff uh, becoming a rocket science in uh, other environments, for example, like uh, rendering something in, Py in, in Python uh, without knowledge of Pygame or some other uh, application like that, or uh, maybe uh, being pretty good in object programming uh, paradigm uh, with uh, multi-threading and classes. Uh, so to get to that, uh, I started from uh, just selecting the two types of data. Of course, you can find a lot of flow graphs how to work with the EEG, but I try to explain the problem on a two kind of the, the, the data types, which are a static data type, which you basically uh, using in a form of uh, as acoustician the EEG from the patient uh, as a file. So you get you can uh, have an in file like uh, from a the uh, many of the amplifiers which which got their software recorder uh application for that so you basically inspect the uh, impedance of the signal you can um for example get some more markers for tactile or other uh triggers to get that in the input and get this kind of structure of data as a file and after that you go and pre-process this, this this data you uh, extract the features from that data maybe you want to classify or analyze that data in some kind of way and basically you publicate the results so um, so this is the mainly uh, most common um, structure of uh, flow uh, flow uh, chart of uh, working with static data and it's not only of course the EEG data it can be basically um, correspondent to all time series data and then another one uh, which we will focus today is the dy dynamic data, which basically works a little bit different. And the most uh, easy, easy one flow graph is one like this. So this is basically kind of BCI uh, flow graph where you get the um, EEG stream as a data frame. So it's not basically a finished uh, data with rows and columns and you know timestamps that you can uh, process um, like in the whole image. And then you of course do a pre-processing, but it's a little bit different because you need to do that in the in this data frame. And of course you can do a future extraction. And for example, in BCI, you do a command recognition and when you execute the um, basically trigger something with a uh, with that feature you extract and uh, recognize, you basically execute some kind of uh, action, interaction, I don't know. Maybe you want to do something with uh, like light bulb, you want to switch it on and off. So basically this is kind of a um, workflow like that. And um, as you basically may found already, these are like these two pipelines are uh, pretty similar, but I but they are basically uh, super different in a workflow. So it's like the things you can use for, for example, for pre-processing in the uh, static data. So when you've got the file, uh, you've got a lot of tools. So you can pre-process the filter stuff and do the. ICA for uh, independent component analysis, uh, for example, to, to, to track the artifacts and, and so on. And when you want to do that, for example, for uh, BCI applications, you will basically not directly pass this uh, preprocessing pipelines into the dynamic data streams. Uh, because for example, and I, I will show you in a moment uh, how it looks in uh, EEG lab in MATLAB. They are designed to be uh, a more stat statistical uh, tools for getting the results. And of course, they got the functions you can use, but you need to extract them from the internal API, which when you have no, uh, which is basically a 
bracket science a little bit. When you are not a computer scientist uh, or basically um, the guy who have uh, developed an intuition and knowledge in, in a kind of uh, time series analysis and IT and build something in low level programming. So, uh, so there, are, there are kind of ways to uh, solve that and to uh, basically not to stop, to, to, to stuck in um, also another problem which is the performance. Uh, when you um, start to work with uh, the static data, so uh, maybe you heard some kind of analysis uh, um, algorithms can compute a lot of time. It depends on how you structure the code, how you want to, um, how much intuition you've got in that what you're doing. And sometimes you need, for example, get a, uh, like let's say 200 repetition of some kind of parameters of a function to get the right intuition which of these parameters you want to use basically in your classification or something and for example if you've got the algorithm like recurrence which sometimes can be calculated for a long time like a one day or half of a day developing an intuition on that can be a little bit hard and Basically, this one algorithm is pretty much complicated and I don't think we can solve that issue even in uh, like use it in the dynamic data uh, just in uh, right now in, in our times. I think we need still a little bit more uh, computed power, but there are many ways to, uh, many other examples with classification uh, like machine learning, but you can uh, basically uh, get to the same um problem here so uh let's look for uh, let's look now for uh, just a little example of uh, this kind of tool which brain products uh brain vision analyzer uh, derives so it's like this is kind of uh, pro um, application that uh, you can find in the universities or uh, other institutions like there are any others, of course. They they do, doing also the systems, e.g. systems. So most of the companies develop some kind of their uh, um, software product to the hard, hardware product, and 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 mo mostly of them they are um, uh, they they have implemented most of the algorithms. So uh, as in the left here, you can see what which algorithm basically this uh, tool have. And uh, they derive sometimes uh, some some possibilities to basically do um, like uh, feedback application or BCI uh, application experiments. But you can find easily and um, in a short time, uh, it can sometimes be uh, like limited to your imagination or to your needs or basically to uh, the way you think about the problem. So, uh, so this is how it looks. Uh, of course, I, I didn't want, I don't want to mention here a, a lot of this kind of application. So let's go to uh, mostly common uh, in that field. So we are here now seeing the pre-processing um, pipeline uh, in the EEG lab, uh, which is the MATLAB toolbox. Uh, which is the uh, one of the first slides in wh where you can basically uh, so in the in the moment where you got this block where is the preprocessing so you can see here how the preprocessing looks for the data which you want to compute uh, and do something with it after so you you see this is all the workflow um, for um, uh, this example is basically from the uh, Michael X Cohen uh, websites. Uh, he he has a. Um, I made a I made a gif gif from it because he had a very cool um, compressed version, like 20, 12 minutes uh, of explaining how to uh, do a preprocessing. And uh, for for example, you can take that knowledge in twelve minutes and do an intuition in a few days and you will be able to do a preprocessing, which you can of course use uh, not only in MATLAB but, but also in any other uh, softwares. So let's look right now, let's say you, we've got this uh, preprocessing done uh, in, in MATLAB and now we 
uh, want to do calculate something. So, for example, as uh, you uh, saw here before, a lot of examples with calculating the uh, connectivity and uh, extracting futures from it. So let's look for right now for uh, example in MATLAB is also uh, from this example is also from uh, the Michael X Cohen course uh, of the neurosciences from zero to hero, which I uh, uh, recommend you to to do if you want uh, basically get the uh, fundamental knowledge about all this type of analysis. But uh, here, for example, you've got the um, the matrix, which uh, is uh, basically, uh, be, we, which is computed to uh, to use it for the connectivity all to all synchronization uh, analysis, and you've got all the examples, and you basically can uh, is about 70, uh, 70 hours course, so uh, it's take a long 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 time to implement all that stuff, but is worth it uh, for sure to get. Uh, Right, right, uh, right point how to do the stuff uh, step by step and basically how the um, static data workflow analysis uh, work. And uh, one nice thing about MATLAB is when you do that, let's go to the next slide, uh, just to showing also more uh, examples of MATLAB uh, doing this kind of thing. So here you've got the uh, scalp uh, labs, uh, uh, lap sound filter for uh, also for electrodes connectivity here and also some kind of uh, spectrum uh, shows and ERP from several channels uh, you can see here and one fine thing about the MATLAB is that you can easily mm, find the functions in Python and re-implement it in Python and also you can um, some of the functions you can basically export into the low level uh, abstraction languages like uh, C++. Uh, because the, the MATLAB is basically based on the Fortran language, which is a uh, language mm, mostly common used to operate the matrices and arrays, um, and uh, have some, of course, limitation, but in that uh, situation is very fast. Some of that function will uh, be basically the same in the C++ as a MATLAB, of course, because um, in Fortran, in some situation, is faster even uh, uh, from C++, but this is a little bit only. Um, the uh, next slides also show uh, the connectivity analysis for power time series correlation. Uh, so uh, we have here the correlation, for example, for uh, different frequencies, and we can correlate which uh, electrodes from each channels uh, basically mm, stuck in uh, desired frequency and where uh, they appear. Uh, so this is how it looks basically in MATLAB. Uh, you can save that results and you can do, uh, like I showed before, uh, more uh, um, analysis on that. And you already know from the before lectures uh, that you can do a lot of that. So this is just... Uh, a brief introduction. This topic is too big uh, to get it from all uh, to the point. So go to the Python right now. And this is also uh, the examples because I, sh I choose the examples uh, that I can share with you if you want. So basically these two courses uh, uh, from Michael X Cohen are basically almost the same, but one is in Python and the another one is um, e in MATLAB. Uh, the Python course is a little bit shorter. Uh, is about uh, the 30 hours uh, of uh, videos and examples and exercises, but it's also basically the same thing. You, you use the Python, you use it in Jupyter Notebook uh, or Colab, and uh, for example, here we can see the ERP uh, from the channel 47 from kind of a, a EEG data structure, so it's like EEG file with uh, all rows and columns of uh, the signal. And uh, also here, for example, we can see uh, described in the wavelet and time series uh, uh, frequency analysis. And uh, yeah, like here, you can see a frequency map uh, and compute it 
um, in, a, in a some sort of time. So you can do uh, this stuff also uh, with uh, Python and they just do uh, like, we just do go as the same thing, uh, as the same way as in, 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 Mat in MATLAB. So you got the um, interpreter, you got the uh, scripting language and you write the lines by lines, um, which uh, compute and produce the, uh, the entire results. And um, there are a few nice uh, examples in uh, this course. For example, this one is to simulate the neural circuit. So uh, basically takes a few hours for uh, this all uh, one subject on the course, but is uh, pretty much uh, interesting. So I just leave it here to uh, get you interest uh, a little bit. Here we've got the simulating a circuit of uh, 1000 neurons. Uh, so it's something like maybe you already saw in some kind of uh, maintain right now, uh, Elon Musk uh, spiking uh, like a graph from the uh, from his uh, neural link product. And of course, you can do uh, some kind of analysis on that. You can you can put some inputs uh, to product the uh, action potential and see how uh, it uh, fit and work with that uh, group of neurons. Uh, so so that's also very cool. Uh, another way to do that, and which is basically uh, going from um, mm, maybe thinking about analyzing something faster or going to uh, work in real time, but also to not be limited and, uh, for example, choosing how many electrodes you want to uh, pass through um, the script and so on. Because if you want to do something with Python, you can briefly like, like find something like when you will do an analysis, analysis for uh, a lot of electrodes, it can uh, basically be pretty slow. So there are basically a ways to do that in interpreted C++, uh, which is, as you see, which is used in uh, CERN, in the root data analysis uh, environment. And uh, it also works in Jupyter. You can find it on their web website. You can find the, uh, basically, ways to do that. And they have uh, almost the same uh, pipeline created. It's like Xplot is uh, some kind of a, a, a smart plot, but more interactive and a little bit faster. And uh, they have some another frameworks you can include, for example, like having the access to a GPU more directly to do visualization or stuff. So uh, it can be useful also. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's um, like a way to go if, if you want in future not stuck in the analysis and basically like uh, develop yourself in uh, more uh, like a way that you will not be focused on going through the rapid science task like uh, optimization and so on. So this can uh, solve a lot of issue in the future. Just thinking like uh, like this for the future, uh, your um, development. So uh, you've got also got Inkstensor, which is like kind of a NumPy library, and it gets even the one-to-one uh, -one, uh, function to function uh, duplication of uh, that ones are in NumPy and this ones in C++. And uh, and yes, and then basically that's just like for a static data uh, analysis. This can be uh, pretty pretty uh, handy. And what, is, what about the dynamic data workflows? So this is the, I think the main problem is like, uh, you've got the stream of data. So if you develop an intuition to work in the data that are not a stream of data, but a frame uh, itself close, it can be sometimes tricky to change, but you're thinking about the data and uh, develop the uh, intuition for example, how fast the frequency are. If, if, if you are a node, for example, I don't know, a practical f uh, physicist who uh, takes a LED lamp and flash it and, and see how exa exactly uh, is fast is uh, which frequency, you can sometimes have like a, a eons of a difference in thinking 
uh, for example, how fast uh, uh, 50 hertz can be, unless you uh, get the um, like some kind of troubles from getting the cables wrong in the uh, power, uh, for example, uh, in, in the wall. So, so then you will feel like zzz, uh, there is a 30, 50 hertz uh, flowing there, and, and maybe there you uh, find uh, it useful also. Uh, so uh, another thing uh, you can find in uh, different is like memory troubles. Uh, it is um, sometimes uh, basically is easier to learn uh, about the object programming, uh, uh, object oriented programming uh, languages, for example, in C++ or another uh, um, application based like that, than for example in Python because of the kind of uh, ways of thinking and kind of um, uh, tr tries to uh, tries to uh, to fit the um, low level language language as a high abstract uh, human readable um, syntax of a language. So sometimes uh, it can be uh, a little bit tricky to uh, get from the Python to C plus plus, or of course. Uh, for example, people who develop intuition in C++, uh, they don't like high abstract um, uh, level uh, languages uh, because of the simplicity, simplicity uh, which is not always uh, useful. Or sometimes, some, 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 sometimes somebody thought it can be useful, but, but can sometimes is just not. Uh, yeah. So uh, this. Uh, Basically, particular is uh, not efficient when working with many electrodes. It's basically, uh, in, in the uh, term of uh, working in real time in Python, uh, where you will for sure fit that problem. And in, yeah, so it needs to take care for proper timing and data streaming. So if you want to do a neural feedback, for example, we just right now we want we know that we need to to do that as fast as as, as we can. So, for example, 100 milliseconds for the or operation uh, with uh, the basically execution the command to the uh, back to the to, to the user, and uh, this can be sometimes also tricky. Uh, all operations takes a little bit of milliseconds, and when you calculate all the pipeline, um, it can be a situation where uh, you already out of the range, or maybe you have no even space for any more experiment to get the right result. And uh, of course, Matplotlib becomes un useless. So if you use the Matplotlib uh, in uh, Python for your data visualization. This is the first problem you get when you even tr figure out how to stream the data. Uh, you will need to just find the new tools, new libraries for uh, doing stuff quicker and to do not overfill a thread in the CPU because uh, this is what's happening when you try to fit the, mo the too much data for a Matloblib um, basically function. Uh, so. Uh, for uh, this kind of things, you can use how in another. How you do you can communicate with the device? So we know that you get a lot of uh, different application and uh, different uh, also amplifiers for different companies, so on, so on. So uh, basically, the scientific uh, community just put something like lab streaming layer. So uh, most of the companies try to um just implement that uh, communication protocol and this makes things uh, more easier it's not so easy as maybe it could be but uh, we've got a point from uh, where to uh, come from so let's say uh, we can use for example lab streaming layer protocol uh, that communicates with the hardware and send to us a data on some port, we can grab it in our application. So we can implement lab streaming layer on the other end in our application and grab the data and collect the data frames uh, in real time. Also, lab streaming layer can get, uh, of course, another uh, another signals, uh, not only EEG, but uh, for example, 
uh, accelerometer or uh, other uh, useful uh, triggers if you design that in your uh, experiment. And uh, here I want to, to introduce you to uh, basically the uh, application uh, we can uh, use for uh, the uh, uh, acoustician and to doing something with real-time signal. So uh, in the uh, first part, we have a Sparrow streamer, which is coming from BrainTech and is uh, pretty, uh, as far I know, for, for right now is integrated with uh, the Perun and other um, products from the BrainTech and is also open source. So it's, uh, of course, a way that you can uh, get, recognize, and implement your um, own applications to that software uh, if you want. Um, yeah. So uh, another way uh, is, of course, to use MNE, uh, which is uh, based on C++, but also have a, a Python wrapper. So people who uh, work uh, with Python usually do some kind of uh, stuff with MNE, uh, which uh, have also a great, um, like, um, have a, a really good tools toolkit uh, to do uh, scientific analysis and also not only dynamic, but also uh, down, uh, like um, um, static data uh, also. Uh, so uh, here we got a good example for uh, using dynamic data workflow in MATLAB Simulink. For example, you've got here the unicorn uh, from GTEC uh, amplifier where you've uh, got the nodes and you, you can uh, basically do some kind of operation here on that nodes and you can also plot the data and uh, design your experiments. And uh, as uh, in MATLAB, you can, of course, design your filters and stuff like that. So uh, this, this comes pretty handy. And a lot of uh, engineering uh, companies do uh, stuff in MATLAB. So like it's a uh, quite common shareable way of doing that. Uh, and of course, you can also uh, design something here. And these nodes also you can export from here as C++ classes, so we can implement it in a uh, other application. Mm. Yeah, and here we go going through for the uh, more uh, multi-purpose kits like uh, Touch Designer, for example, which is uh, the, the application that, of course, give you ability to work with the signal, but also give you ability to uh, contain the signal with video, with uh, uh, Kinect devices, for example, VR, XR, and all these stuff, you can easily uh, find a lot of resources how to uh, do a visualization trigger on some data, filters, and so on. And uh, this can be handy when you want to uh, do some kind of interaction like uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of, this, this one is shot from my diploma where uh, with the EEG uh, used for uh, basically uh, for triggering uh, some uh, sounds in the space, which can be changed via the stick by using uh, a predefined physics uh, in the room, which is the particle system, and this particle system changes change the uh, pitch of the uh, feedback from that person which is hearing uh, as a feedback. So basically, if the guy in the right is not doing nothing, uh, nothing is changing. She's only listening to her thoughts on uh, some kind of pitch shifts. But when uh, when this guy in the right is just changing the stick in the space, in, in the air, he basically uh, changed the pitch of uh, some elect virtual electrodes which are in the system inside. So maybe I have some video here you can see yeah so some states are just uh, visualized uh, for one person and the second person this basically is changing the uh, shifts uh, and pitches of the tones 
uh, on, of, of the sound, which uh, are based on the Doppler effect. Uh, yeah, so this can be useful, like you see, for this kind of application where you want to do uh, something in a space, you want easy to uh, don't stuck, for example, in making a projection in uh, like uh, you want to make a three or four screens uh, where you want to present something. You can do that easy with, with this application. You can design that and stuff like that. And of course, you can do all the stiff things with uh, the uh, the signal. Another way you can do that is, of course, you can use a Max MSP, which is a musical framework. Uh, also uh, worked in a kind of uh, mid-level of abstraction, so uh, you can find the patches to uh, receive as OSC, for example, uh, some uh, some data uh, and to do some logic to, uh, like, uh, I don't know, as you hear in this example, define the high attention and low attention. So there are a lot of uh, this one. I think example is yeah, for mind wave. Uh, yeah, and here we, we've got another example of the Max. So we've got here the piano, uh, which is a VST virtual instrument uh, connected to the uh, frequency bands of uh, the desired. Uh, uh, for the uh, power frequency of desired bands. And uh, and also we've got the VVV, uh, which is the uh, another, this kind of software, you can do it bad. And it's mostly based on direct digs, so the core is a little bit changed from uh, from the others. But uh, it has a similar to Max MSP workflow and uh, and also you can find then some other examples to uh, find the methods how to work with uh, with signal visualize it and um, and do some kind of uh, uh, system uh, system prototyping here and uh, one uh, I found um, not so uh, far ago is a neuromore which is which looks like it's coming to be an application that you can uh, design as uh, basically it's a node environment but it's, uh, as you can see is designed to work with neuro data so uh, in the start you've got implemented here like OpenBCI, the gigo the muse and uh, i think they uh, they will uh, try to implement more of um, acoustician devices uh, for that and uh, you can choose here for uh, like uh, you can construct here the experiments using the uh, desired um, like uh, using this uh, function they provide here so for example here we've got like a sketch for uh, for uh, like a test system, which is receiving the EEG data, and we've got here uh, uh, basically uh, the the flow, flow graph for easy and quick prototyping of a baseline analysis, baseline uh, normalization. So uh, we've got the node which is recording some trails uh, for desired part of time, and after that we normalize uh, our signal through that baseline, so we can easier define the triggers and find uh, like um, uh, don't be interrupted with uh, with some uh, um, unwanted data and uh, there is also open vibe this is a very last very um, like uh, old project i can say uh, but it's still in development and uh, it's uh, uh, it, it was tried to be kind of uh Neuro MATLAB, um, maybe EEG lab, but real time uh, for real, real time processing. And in some part, some kind of part of this, uh, it uh, it has a really uh, I don't know how to I don't want to be too ordinary, but um, not um, friendly user interface. Uh, so uh, and it's also uh, quite. Um, far for uh, getting like the right intuition and thinking some some kind of stuff we, you you can uh, see that are uh, basically created uh, by different persons so uh, the uh, 
is not a constant constant uh, well, uh, as, as, as a whole. Uh, and uh, the main problem I think you can uh, see is to derive the intuition to developing an intuition in um, in using uh, different kind of data types and uh, basically to uh, to find a way before you start to uh, or even right now you start to thinking about what you want to do with uh, neural data you it's good to find out and to have uh, like a just a little uh, introduction over tools where you uh, can find it useful because sometimes as I as I say before in the, in the beginning uh, you want to prototype some, some, something fast and you can stuck on a very um, uh, very easy task in, in, in different environments uh, but they are becoming a rocket science task uh, because you develop an intuition, for example, in static data and you're doing something totally wrong uh, with uh, the art of doing that. Yeah, so I think I fit in the time. We've got the five minutes uh, if somebody wants to ask something. Mm. Okay, thank you, Ukesh, a lot for this uh, for this lecture. And actually, uh, I have some uh, some questions to you. Um, well, uh, so first of all, uh, do you prefer uh, performing the analysis of uh, the EEG data uh, with MATLAB or or with Python? What would be better? Uh, I think you will find like the uh, answer is pretty easy. If you've got a lot of money, you can go for MATLAB and, and uh, basically grab your tools like uh, guns for the war and, and do that stuff there. And this uh, and it will, will be fine. The, uh, um, the com uh, computing time will be most uh, uh, situation will be almost the same. Uh, sometimes, of course, MATLAB will be faster, as I saw, uh, without Python, without uh, being optimized. But I think a way to go is like uh, I, how I did that. It was like uh, I tried to develop an intuition in in MATLAB to grab the uh, basically the skills uh, that are uh, useful and commonly used in, uh, in like a science society, and after that. Uh, to develop, uh, to basically to swap the, the tools to uh, uh, to the Python, and um, for me personally, is the way to go because you will be very uh, like surprised how many things are uh, not uh, right documented in, for example, in Python, or kind uh, some kind of uh, things are also sometimes counterintuitive uh, in way of doing that. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is a hard to start with MATLAB because uh, the cost of the like uh, the entry to 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 that all toolboxes uh, and if you want to have it like uh, um, up to date is a pretty 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 costly. So uh, so definitely here if somebody is starting, I think the. Uh, this kind of course, or like the master Pi Python by scientific uh, projects uh, from Michael X. Cohen's one, one of the starting point where, where you can find find it useful, and um, it's cost you only the the course, and also the the teacher is kind of really cool guy. You can write him an email, and I think he will give you the course for free. Uh, just uh, just from from my uh, experience, I can say that. So so this is like. Uh, like for uh, starting programming uh, MATLAB between uh, between Python, mm -hmm. some some things you can find uh, uh, are easier to to basically like get in a, uh, in in MATLAB for example to topographical uh, maps you have got uh, more implementation for that, uh, but it's not so hard to reimplement it. It's even good way to do that to to try to re-implement, for example, the interpolation between that and create your own, own function. Yeah. Mm, OK, so we have uh, time for one more question. Uh, well, uh, someone asked uh, ask if uh, those tools like uh, VVV or Max 
um, must be are uh, usable for something else than just cool looking stuff can we implement it um in more like meaningful things uh, i mean i can uh, can they be used in medical environment for example or other environmental research Yes, of course. Uh, I think even uh, Dr. Tomasz Rutkowski used the Max MSP uh, in his experiment in uh, some kind of publication. You can find it in, in Google Scholar, uh, where they use Muse and, and uh, use uh, Max MSP for, uh, for, uh, as, as a DSP a music application for feedback. So, uh, so for sure, yes. Uh, is, uh, remember that most of them, they have open source or some kind of API where the API is uh, basically a little like uh, low uh, level. So you can implement even in C++ your own classes. So I don't see any like uh, uh, troubles from that. I, I think this even sometimes is even better because uh, we uh, one time we compared, uh, for example, uh, my workflow of doing the uh, example or ex or experiment in Touch Designer to the Python workflow with the good type Python programmer, right? And I did in the same time ten experiments, and he didn't almost finish one because of mm -hmm. the way of doing that. So, uh, so it's of course uh, based on what you what what you need. Of course, if you've got the your uh, excellent pipeline and PsychoPy, for example, and you've got your libraries and you've done 100 experiment in that, there is no need to, 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 to switch the, the, the tool. I think it's more informative for the people who uh, basically don't know where to start and, and how to uh, mm -hmm. don't get uh, like, uh, you know, oh my God, this is all so, so too hard for me. I can understand that. I don't know what is going on here and, and so on. Okay. We don't have very good resources for right now mm -hmm. for that. We will wait for the Yannick, right? He said uh, they will do some kind of uh, things in, interactive in, in, in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very curious about that uh, real-time uh, application in Jupyter, how they will perf perform. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're running out of time a little bit, so there yeah. are, uh, there is one question more, but I will send it to you, and if you could answer uh, like uh, uh, on messages, so I will direct the answer to our participants. Uh, thank you for, for this workshop, Lukasz. I think it was very useful for uh, many of us, and uh, I think that it would be... Uh, great if you could actually maybe share your presentation on Discord because uh, some people ask for the, um, the notebooks or uh, other so uh, resources uh, from they could uh, get uh, the info uh, so it would be great if you could do this. Yeah, sure. I will just create some kind of folder uh, with, okay. uh, with all the stuff. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much once again. Uh, so now uh, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, last, but of course not uh, least uh, speaker. And uh, so uh, let me uh, first of all uh, introduce uh, uh, him to, to you. So uh, Adam uh, Molnar is a co-founder of Neurable and uh, leading brain computer interface BCI company, uh, an active leader of NeuroTechX, uh, the world's largest neurotechnology community, as we can, can already know, and recipient of Forbes 30 under 34 consumer uh, technology. Additionally, uh, Adam is focused on behavior and decision making and work directly with uh, neurable partners to valuably apply objective neural insights for B2B application. Uh, so um, what is more, his experience includes uh, qualitative consulting at uh, Indicia Consulting, as well as having previously co-founded a startup on subjective value paradigms and later managing the early stage uh, tech startup incubator. And 
Well, Adam will conduct workshops and a little, uh, a little but uh, some kind of different uh, because uh, we are going to make uh, some kind of interview like a Q&A about the application of neurotechnology and um, we would like to get to know uh, as much as we uh, can from someone that experience. So, Adam, uh, are you with us? <laughs> Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hello. It's Thank great. You for having uh, me. It's great to have you here. Uh, well, as I said, it would be some kind of uh, interview, so there are uh, many questions. And of course, uh, if some of you have uh, other questions, uh, please just write them directly in the chat, and I I will redirect them to to Adam. Uh, so uh, hello again, and uh, well, uh, can we start? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, uh, maybe I will stop uh, presenting uh, this that uh, we could see each other better. So, uh, first uh, question. Uh, so, why did you, Adam, choose the neurotechnology? Why, why this field? Uh, what is so attractive about it? Because I think it's very, very new and it's great to, to be in this, like, DP. You know, I'll answer the appreciation I've developed for neurotechnology, but I'll also tell you the true story of how I got into it, which is to some degree like coincidental. I, I kind of fell into it. Uh, my path to BCI and, and the rest of neurotechnology started back uh, I, after I graduated the University of Michigan. Uh, I had gone to consulting and Sophia very nicely presented. Um, but I, I didn't feel right. I, I didn't want to just go straight to work. Uh, I, I knew that I could get a full-time job or I could go to grad school at any point in my life. And I was very fortunate for that, but it was only at this point in time that I had the, the fewest obligations to other people. With that insight, I decided that I wanted to start my own company. So my first company actually had nothing to do with neurotechnology. It was, uh, a, a mobile app based on bartering and machine learning uh, using the idea that you and I value things differently. So how can we take advantage of that to get the most out of it? Ultimately, it didn't necessarily work out because my co-founder was an international and uh, we had visa problems. But anyway, that, that's not the fun part. The fun part was uh, because that didn't go through, I, I then became the program director for an incubator called TechArt. And there I met this crazy neuroscientist named Dr. Ramsey Zalkate. And he had this amazing technology where with this wild, I was the first time I was introduced to a 32 electrode ar array uh, with a 10 pound amplifier. <laughs> uh, and you, you would get this cap on someone after about 45 minutes of setup. And with that, you were able to actually drive a, a remote control car. And then I learned, later learned that how he was doing this was he had developed these innovations in P300 detection. And after a, a, a very long path and, and a, a wild story, Rames has basically asked me to join him as, as a co-founder of Neurable to create the future of brain-computer interfaces and, and technologies we know it. So what we did with, so I, that's like my actual story of how I got to Neurable. But my appreciation for it comes, I, I think it, it's from the, the very first presentation I saw Ramsey's, my co-founder give, where he was explaining how the relationship that we have with computers is an, an evolving one. That you know, We began with uh, warehouse-sized computers that were fed with punch cards that required really specialized knowledge. And then from there, it was a, a debt, like, Smartphone technology existed a decade before Apple made the capacitive touchscreen the standard. Uh, and, and what we see with these really big examples of computing systems, the, the marquee platforms, if you will, the personal computer and then the smartphone, we see that the, the distance between man and machine diminishes and it gets closer and closer every time. And it really comes down to how we interact with the computer. And, we're at a point in time where we literally touch and speak to our devices. So our bet, well, our understanding was that, well, if we have the ability to do hands-free control, 
and if we have the ability to somewhat understand the brain better, how does this fit in with the next medium of computing, which is immersive computing? So we took the P300 detection technology that we have, which boiled down as really good signal processing and inside like secrets about how we do things. And what we did was we built a, a really cool demo where we could control virtual reality with your mind uh, using the P300. And that was my long answer to your question. Yes, I think that uh, sometimes it's great when uh, by coincidence you meet someone who would inspire you uh, that much that you can change your uh, like profession uh, like directly, completely different uh, direction. And uh, it's, uh, I think that um, I assume that it was great idea uh, looking at uh, how much you achieved right <laughs> now. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, th this was six years ago and in the six mm -hmm. years I have learned more than I ever will have. I've gotten to meet such amazing people. I get to work with like the coolest freaking technology you can imagine. Um, so I'm extremely fortunate. And, and, and I, I don't want to share it, but it has also been an absurd amount of work. It has been oh, a lot of stress. <laughs> My hair has probably gone back one inch. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I have no regrets at all. Yes, yeah, so that's great. So. Uh... Like, can we say that uh, the professor uh, of neuroscience, uh, which you have met, uh, was your inspiration to go through this topic? Or maybe there is some other person who pushed you to more specified and better decision, or maybe some scientists you would be looking at and thought like, oh, I want to be like him someday, or I want to do the neurotechnology someday. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I would say a lot of my inspiration actually happens on the psychology side, but it was when I met my co-founder, it, it wasn't so, I mean, yes, I find him extremely inspiring, but it, he wasn't my inspiration to do what I'm doing. He is my partner in what I'm doing. And the inspiration comes from the idea that you can take an idea that you have and actually create it. You can manifest it. And that is the most exciting thing of all. In my opinion. Yes, I mean, I I share your opinion because when you do something and you actually see that it can be done and uh, it is useful and people use it and um, in many different ways and develop your idea, I think this is very uh, very satisfying for a person who have uh, achieved and developed this and uh, this idea, but uh, didn't you have you ever thought like uh, this uh, kind of technologies, uh, like neurotechnologies, could be a little bit dangerous because I think that a lot of people uh, who like um, isn't so uh, aren't so common with this uh, neurotechnology stuff mm -hmm. just think that it could be dangerous and like uh, robots and computers will rule the world someday and we are helping him helping them in that. Uh, have you ever made such opinion? or maybe um, for be dangerous? Yeah, I, I get those questions and those concerns often, and I, I think they're important concerns. Not necessarily because I think the technology is actually dangerous, but because people actually care. Because people care, it's that we need to listen and understand why do they care. I, I think a lot of it comes to a lack of awareness and understanding about what is neurotechnology, that people hear the brain and then assume that that means everything like, will this steal my passwords or my, my credit card? Like the answer is, is no, but that, that doesn't mean, or at least no, right? but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about that. So I actually lead a lot of neuroethics conversations about this very topic, that the fact that people care about it is more than enough for companies to also care about it. So like my company, Nurble, for example, like we have an open sense that we won't sell your data. Like that's, that's just not what we want to do. And trust me, I've been offered a lot of money in order to do that. Um, and as a small company, as a startup, like to turn down money is, is a luxury. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think it's super important. I think that the like, whoa, singularity is, is something that, uh, you know, is either of science fiction or of a long, long time away that there is 
a lot of harm that our smartphone can do that we need to better understand that like neurotechnology is like a little bit away. So like, I don't want to just wave it away saying like, we shouldn't be worried about it now because we should be aware about it now. But I, I think it's helpful to understand where it falls with perspective of other technologies that people don't necessarily create technologies to be good or bad. They create them and then how they're used is then good or bad. Uh, I think one interesting thing about that is a lot of how that happens is with who the customers are. So if the customers are okay with bad applications, you're going to have that. If the customers, if the end user, if the people who are on this call want to use it for good, it's going to be used for good. So I think, uh, at least for me and Nervo, like we have a responsibility to set the tone for, especially for how bigger companies will, will, will use this type of technology, but not dangerous uh, right now, should be monitored, should be understood, and should be built with intention. Mm -hmm. Yes, because the thing is, I uh, very often to kind of uh, like tell people that it's not wrong, it's uh, like beneficial for their uh, for their health, and to kind of convince them that it will not make any uh, any harm. Uh, but I think that this is a quite a hard thing to do, especially if you want to came up with something completely new for them and maybe a breakthrough. But there are some still people who will not uh, take it for granted they want uh, to look at it from like few years and see how it's going to to develop but uh, do you think that uh, i mean that the case how would the um, would the world be in this 25 uh, for example years do we are are we going to use neurotechnology on our later daily basis or maybe there's something more it's a fun question that's hard to answer. So I, I think of, let, let's like distill neurotechnology, let's just talk about EEG, that's what I know best. I think EEG is something like where heart rate understanding was a couple decades ago. So today, because we have Apple Watches and Fitbits and all of these other fitness trackers, we've collected so much information and understanding about heart rate that we're able to do so much more with it. And we're able to put it in form factors that people actually win. Similar, like look at EEG, like right now, the predominant use of EEG is for laboratory environments. Now I can show something cool. So Nervo's trying to change this. So we built these headphones. This is a prototype, this doesn't actually, this is a like a model. Uh, so what we built is we made headphones with novel sensors that feel like a normal pair of headphones. And while you're wearing them, put them on. Oh no. They just look like a pair of headphones. And I, I think that's super important. Because like if you want people to use new technology, you can't ask them to adopt even more new behaviors. Like how Fitbit became so successful, how Apple Watch is so successful, is because they didn't ask you to do anything different. Like everyone wears a watch, or not everyone. People know to wear watches. It's not weird to wear a watch. And what they did was they then put an electrocardiogram and a pedometer into that form factor. And what we're trying to do is take headphones, something that people use every day, and turn it into a BCI system. Uh, so yeah. But okay, to answer your question, 25 years from now, right? Um, I think we'll we'll definitely have to the extent that people wear Apple Watches and Fitbits right now, we'll see people you wearing BCI in that regard. And I think it will be a cognitive component. So it's like if Fitbit is a fitness tracker, I predict that this will be like a, a cognitive tracker. So like a, an ability to understand cognitive states and, and the established ones, the ones that we know about. The like cool, fun things, like the futuristic use cases, uh, is and, and this is one of the ones that like really caught me on her early was the ability to have experiences that understand you. I think someone mentioned something in chat about it pre earlier, but like, how can you have a movie or an immersive virtual reality experience? Like, how can the characters know what's going on inside your head literally, and then create the story accordingly? 
One of the really cool use cases that we thought about for the P300 when we, when we were first starting out was how could we use that in a storytelling sense? So we had this idea that like we would create a, a movie or like a, a virtual reality experience where there was like a killer and the killer had a knife. And if you saw the knife, then the story went one way. If you didn't see the knife, the story would go another way. And that's just like one really cool example when you have the capability to understand what's going inside someone's head. Well, yes, I mean, <laughs> uh, this would be indeed great. But uh, when, when it comes to talking about the futurism and this kind of stuff, so we have uh, one question for uh, one of our participants. Uh, it's quite uh, long, but uh, I will read it all. Uh, so. <laughs> Well, uh, can we create avatar, upper half we can take from InMove robot, open source, 3D printed, his legs not working very good, legs from self-walking robot Poppy, also 3D printed, in lab we do uh, own legs, both of them open source. Please will be, person will be controlling robot uh, remotely using VR and PCI, uh, we need just to stabilize, stabilize at uh, idle it can be good for people who cannot move to interact with other people on um stairs yeah so I, I think what they're asking is how can we take existing pieces of technology to create uh, essentially like replicate um ready player one or I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with ready player one it's a fundamental book that covers virtual reality and then it was turned into a movie but basically like when will we have a reality where you could wear something and that then projects into an external character in another reality other one or whatever so the feasibility of that right now and what they're trying to do is provide recommendations of what you could use for um I, I think I would look at what are the limitations and what are the capabilities of BCI. Let's not even touch virtual reality right now. Let's just talk about BCI. So BCI right now is like, is extremely limited. Uh, the telekinesis future the, that that's going to require invasive sensors because like there is a limitation of how much data you can get from the brain non-invasively. So think about like how BCIs can be used and why they would be used. Like they're not necessarily the best control input system for every si single situation. So um, in terms of building an avatar, I would think about it in terms of what are the, the benefits of BCI and then how can you incorporate it? So like from my perspective, if a company like Neuropol, for example, were able to measure attention, which we can, then, <laughs> How would you have how would you build that into the avatar so that when you're speaking to them they respond with that in mind but like you always got to build with the limitations uh it uh, it has something with it that now we have so many ideas how to upgrade a human and what we can do with this technology how we can incorporate it to our brain or body or how we can control it and i think that there there is many very like weird even ideas but uh have you heard of uh, this kind of stuff like something very very weird and like even unprobable but someone just has an idea to do it and maybe actually work on it so the weirdest um, thing with bcr or uh, bci or other technologies uh like for now something. weird is like a hard thing to say because that's extremely subjective uh mm -hmm. i'll say a fun thing that i get asked about which i think is really interesting is i get a lot of interest from children who watch the show um sword art online sao because they have this technology called the nerve gear the nerve gear is basically that that's the like 50 year technology that is embedded into your brain and can like project your actual self in a digital environment and and a lot of people ask me like how can we build a nerve gear and i'm like uh <laughs> 
10 trillion dollars of investment in 50 years of development <laughs> Well, but uh, do you prefer, for example, this uh, more neuro side or maybe this more technological stuff from aside from uh, your work? It is true. Excuse me. Um, Bless you. <laughs> thank you. I'm not. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Uh, well, because we are talking about uh, neurotechnology and also the person who inspired you and like showed you the neuroscience were, was uh, like neuroscientists. But now you uh, like merge those two fields together. But if you uh, was about to choose the neuroscience, uh, like the um, how the brain, how does the brain work, or maybe this technology and developing <laughs> technologies, what is more interesting? Well, the, the cool thing is that, so Ramsey is my co-founder, the neuroscientist. He's also an engineer. So he was an engineer first and then went to do his PhD in neuroscience. So he's actually both. So, uh, and, and I think that's an important connection because there's only so much that you can do in practice by understanding the brain. At some point, you got to go into the engineering solutions and figure out what is the math? What is the statistics? How do we use computer science to push this even further? So like, I'm interested in both. I don't know, I'm sorry. I'm interested both in the neuroscience and the technology because the, they're not two separate things. They're actually connected mm -hmm. uh, and they, they push each other. Yes, I think that um, the the thing about integrating to different fields uh, like for, for uh, the the current world and how where we live, it's important for developing it because, as you said, it's hard to separate it. Um, but uh, well, do you think, uh, for example, that uh, this uh, neurohumanism, uh, sorry, transhumanism uh, thing, uh, is uh, actually like important? Do you believe that it will happen soon? Uh, for example, to to change our bodies using technology. Uh, going this way or I, I don't know. I think like transhumanism is, is a tough subject because it's uh, it comes down to semantics. It's like, what does transhumanism mean to you? Because like, from my perspective, antibiotics are transhumanism. Like that's allowing us to do things beyond what we would normally be able to do. So like, I don't know. Yes and no. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I think transhumanism sometimes can go a little bit too far into science fiction. Um, and like, so in, in, until there's like a more solid definition, it's hard to speak about it concretely. I think that using technology will always make us better, stronger than our, smarter than ourselves. And there are like uh, thousands of examples of that. Like us using this technology right now allows us to communicate, how many people on the call? 26 across, I don't know how many countries, uh, across how many miles. So like that's transhumanism in my opinion. But I understand they're like the biohackers who want to hear about like when will my neural implant be available so that my memory will be 1,000 times stronger and like I think those are the wrong questions. I think the what I would like to see energy directed to is like what is the technology of this and how can I use that for good and whether that's transhumanism or not fine whatever but like that's what I think is really important. Mm, okay, uh, we have another question for our participants. So, what industries can most benefit from non invasive BCIs and how? Great question. Um, historically, the capability of BCI has been extremely limited. Uh, how we got started was we were doing EEG for people who are locked in, so people who have no motor control, and that was their very last means of communication. So, it's not necessarily the best way to communicate but it was a, a way for them to. Taking that little kernel and moving it to industry, what I mean is that you, you gotta see what is the potential, what is the capability, what are the limitations and work within that. So with my company, for example, I, I think education is one of the biggest areas that stands to benefit from BCIs. Uh, an interesting concept is like, if you go to the gym and you work out your, your muscles, you can feel sore the next day. Or if you're nervous, you can feel your heartbeat. And what those two examples have are physical feedback markers. There's literal feedback associated with the feeling. You can 
feel that your muscles are sore. You can feel when your heart is beating faster. What you don't have is how there's no feedback with your brain. Unless you do some like retrospective reflection, actually meditation is pretty good for this. It, it's very hard to understand what's going on in your mind. So I think what we're trying to build and what BCI can solve, and it's been shown to work in laboratory environments. And what my company does is take laboratory technologies and then make it usable by normal people. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential in the, in the area of understanding yourself. So whether that's for uh, workplace wellness or education, uh, I, I think those industries stand to benefit a ton from that. And then there's obviously like, okay, there's so many people are waiting for me. So the gaming, like gaming definitely stands to benefit from BCI. I feel like I, I, I laugh because I was like, I was talking with one of my co-founders uh, a couple of years ago. I was like, you know, we could make the scariest virtual reality game of all time. Like we can make an experience that knows when you're not paying attention to be like, ah! <laughs> uh, and it, it's like little things like that, that will grow into even bigger and more valuable use cases. So it's like, it's a ton of potential, but it needs really good ed execution. Because if you don't execute well, then you're going to have more and more people being like, this is a scary, dangerous technology that we don't fully understand. And that, I think, doesn't help the field. Mm -hmm. Well, I have uh, one last question uh, because um, like we were wondering if maybe those times are pushing us to work on neurotechnology, but maybe it's just a moment of uh, kind of a hype on neurotechnology. So maybe it will be just like a few years and everything uh, will change completely. So neurotechnology will go like away and we are going to use something else. <laughs> you know, it's a, it, that's a really good question. Um, as someone who's been working on this for six years now, like I worked on it before it was cool and before there was. So I anticipate that I will continue working on it, even if the hype dies down. And, and that's all that you can do, because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is take an idea, make it real and allow that to give value to someone else. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that's great to continue working on it. So thank you once again. I mean, it was so quick, this uh, interview. I have in my head like many more questions. Uh, like, thank you for answering and for being here with us because uh, I personally think that it was very inspiring because many young uh, people would love to like take uh, an example from you and from your work and your technologies and develop it. So it was great to to have you with us to, uh, like My today. Pleasure. And thank you. Thank you a lot, really. It was great. <laughs> to no, thank you. Uh, this is uh, the fun meetings that I get to have. And uh, <laughs> talking to you, I'm talking to all the people who are on this call. I know people who I'm going to be talking to in a year or in two years or in three years because these are the people that are going to make this field reality. So thank you. We hope that so much. <laughs> but thank you once again. And hear you soon, hopefully. <laughs> Likewise. OK. Ciao, everyone. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Bye -bye. OK, guys. So uh, our uh, third block of lectures and speeches, it's over. Uh, as I announced, uh, now we are going to make a little integration, like some brainstorming of ideas uh, which could inspire you for um, tomorrow's work. Uh, after it, uh, there is also a possibility to stay and start with us and to me, uh, like know each other more uh, within uh, every teams who would like to join. So not only um, uh, in, in your team, but the, the other as well. And uh, well, I think that we are going to uh, change the, uh, the platform to, to Discord. Um, so you are there and we will give you more information uh, like soon, like very soon in two, three minutes. Uh, we also provide you a guidebook for the whole event and your work. And if you have any questions, you can uh, ask, the, ask us uh, directly on the Discord or uh, email us or maybe call us on Discord. 
what do you want and hopefully uh, see you there and thank you for being here and listening on those lectures uh, i hope that it was fun it was fun and it was inspiring and you will uh, get many many ideas and great projects uh, during the next uh, 24 hours so thank you a lot and uh, see you soon on the Discord platform.